So a very warm welcome to you who are on site as well as you who are online. We have about 150 people signed up to be here in person and 130 watching us. So it's uh, 300 people to say a very warm welcome to Rainy Malma today. <laughs> um, and my name is Sarah Lede. I'm a senior strategy and project manager for Medicon Valley Alliance. And I'm also involved in the Microbiome Signature Project, which is a partnership between MBA, COPCAP, and Invest in Squana. And with me on stage are Camilla Munter. I am investment manager and the project leader of Microbiome at Copenhagen Capacity. And, and my name is Michael Jory. I am a senior investment advisor and project lead for Invest in Skåne in this project. And together we will be your moderators today. And we represent the Microbiome Signature Project, where <laughs> since 2019 we have worked together to position this exciting region as one of the leading microbiome clusters in Europe. Um, and you saw a glimpse of what we have achieved over the past three years through the video that you just saw. Yeah. Some of the numbers here you also perhaps saw in the film, but uh, Medicon Valley is home to more than 80 organizations from the life science <coughs> cluster, and here specifically then within the microbiome field. Half of these, 40, are companies who are involved in developing microbiome-based therapies and solutions. And since year 2000 and up to 2021, more than 1,600 microbiome-related publications have come out of this fast-growing microbiome cluster. Our researchers are very much internationally bound. They are collaborating with more than 80-plus countries. And finally, since 2015, we've had more than 80 plus microbiome clinical trials in our region. So, really strong numbers coming out of this small region with only 4.3 million people. One thing that we discovered quite early in our project was, let's say, the diversity of the research the, and also the commercial activities we have in our region. And illustrated by this, um, this picture here, you can see that we are basically all over the field. And then you can say, is it really focus? Can you really do something being focused? Can it really deliver value when you have this spread? And yes, I would say we can, because we have really strong universities. We have fantastic research facilities. We have a good base of uh, service and, and uh, yeah, CROs. In, in the region. Um, and then we also have strong incubation systems. Uh, and actually, uh, also very pleased to, to have some uh, representatives from, from the financing side here today. We also actually are seeing that we are attracting more and more capital into this field. And this is, of course, also seen from, let's say, all the, the values and the strongholds we have in our region, from, let's say, the cohorts, uh, the uh, very concentrated ecosystem. Uh, we have the, um, uh, the strong history, actually. One thing that you really think about when you talk about microbiome is, of course, fermentation. And fermentation, Denmark, we Swedes immediately think great beers. But actually, fermentation is very much about other things as well. So... <laughs> Uh, we think it, it actually provides a lot of really good opportunities for people to be active in the microbiome field, all the way from research to commercial activities. Mm. So there's a lot of things boiling in our region, and today we'll get a foretaste of some of the commercial innovations that are coming out of this exciting ecosystem we have in Medicon Valley. But before we go into that, we'll also hear from two speakers, one on how a US-based investor views Medicon Valley when it comes to investment opportunities in the microbiome, and the second on how a locally grown startup has made waves globally in the microbiome scene. And of course, this will be followed by nine pitches across three sessions before we decide on who our top pitching companies will be by the end of the day. And what will our winner stand to win, Mekko? Yes, even uh, uh, this is a pitching session where, of course, it's very important for you companies, I should be looking there, uh, to have fun, 
to uh, share your competence, to learn new things, and uh, uh, also try to take the opportunity to mingle and network with others, because that could really realize your dreams and your passion that you're sitting there waiting to really share with the rest of the world. And the prizes today will actually be three partnering tickets and pitching sessions at next year's Nordic Life Science Days that will be held in Copenhagen end of November. So uh, it would be a fantastic opportunity to show the rest of the world how far your company has gone for another year. And uh, from our honorable jury, we have also been told that some of them will actually offer you individual coaching and feedback sessions after uh, the, this uh, pitching day. And on and that note, talking about the jury, we are so pleased to have such a strong and international jury with us here today. So here, sitting on the front row, we have Klaus Andersen from uh, at Sunst Sunstone Life Science Ventures, general partner there. Uh, Sunstone Life Science Ventures is an independent European venture capital investment firm based in Copenhagen. Next is Adriana Toma Oel. <laughs> Adriana is a business development and strategic partnership manager from Eurocare, a French investment company supporting Europe, UK and Israeli synthetic biologists and microbiome experts in launching ambitious and impactful startups. And you, when not traveling, you are based in Lyon, in France. Next, we have Denise Kelly with us. Denise is investment advisor from Seventure Partners, and you are a specialist in human microbiome field. And when you're not traveling, you are based in Aberdeen, Scotland. Next in the row, we have Johan Christensen, a local one, <laughs> almost, <laughs> based in Stockholm. But Johan is partner at HealthCap, a European venture capital firm investing exclusively and globally in life sciences. And last but not least, we have Michelle Dubar. Michelle is executive director at MSD. He is a business development licensing professional with experience in all steps of business transactions within the global pharmaceutical, biotechnology and diagnostic industries. And you are based in London. Give them a big hand of applause. So of course our jury are really crucial here in deciding who our top two winners are to win the Jury's Choice Award. But it doesn't stop there because you, our audience, will get to determine who the third winner will be. So I'll ask you to take out your mobile phones, switch on the camera app and scan the QR code with your camera app, where a link will pop up starting with mva.org. Click on the link and you will enter into an online platform. And in that online platform, you will get a chance to vote for your favorite pitching companies, ask questions, along the day, follow the program and see who else is in the room and so on. And how it should look like is this. On the left is a screenshot of the web-based platform. And if you click on Q&A, you will see that there are two parts to it. The Q&A, of course, is where you can ask questions to our speakers. But the poll part, which is live now, allows you to select your top three choices. And the question is, which company would you want to invest in? Where would you want to put your money in? and choosing your first, second, or third will have an impact. So if you are first, they'll be more heavily weighted than the third choice. So make your choices wisely. And you can make your choices throughout the day, you can change your mind throughout the day, until about four plus when I give the signal, then the poll will close. And the same for you online, you should see the same platform on the right of your screen where you get to ask questions and participate in the poll as well. So make sure you stay engaged and pay attention and listen closely to our eight pitching companies. But before we go into that, thank you so much, Camilla and Mikkel. We will see more of them throughout the day. Um, and of course, we will all be around during the break, so you feel free to grab us if you have more questions about what we're doing in the microbiome. But first, I mentioned that we're going to hear a voice from the US and what is his view on the microbiome opportunities in Medicon Valley. 
So it's my great privilege to welcome on stage Peter Bach, Managing Director of Back Bay Life Science Advisors. Peter has more than 12 years of experience with a broad range of research approaches, cellular, molecular, and biochemical fields from immunology and infection through oncology. At Back Bay Life Science Advisors, Peter regularly works with companies of all scales, from startup to global life science brands. And therefore, Peter is well positioned to share with us where the most exciting developments and biggest investment opportunities are when it comes to the microbiome. So welcome, Peter. The floor is yours. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks very much, uh, Sarah, Camilla, and Michael, for inviting me to talk today. Um, and I'll try to keep it on time so we weren't immediately uh, behind, uh, thanks to the first speaker. So what I thought uh, I'd talk about today is sort of a 30,000-foot view of uh, the investment space, the transactional space, and a few vignettes about new, um, maybe not new to you, but uh, new areas of uh, developing partnership uh, and investment within uh, the microbiome space. So I'll talk a little bit about where we've been seeing investment globally um, across the microbiome field. I'll just note that you know, much of this talk is going to be focused on therapeutics, so companies and assets pursuing a FDA and the EMA um, prescription registered um, regulatory pathway, but I'll intersperse um, at a few points during the talks uh, data in and around uh, diagnostics, direct-to-consumer um, uh, data points as well. Um, I'll talk a little bit about where historically a lot of the partnerships um, have been within the space, not only from a phase, but also from therapeutic areas. But most importantly, looking in the last few years where we've seen some of the money going uh, with respect to the microbiome, across the various approaches, be it therapeutics, be it diagnostics, within therapeutics, uh, the types of areas um, and the types of drugs people have been investing in um, and how that's changed, uh, not only from a modality perspective, um, but also from a therapeutic area uh, perspective as well. So starting way back when, pre-pandemic, <laughs> pre a lot of the data that I'll be sharing uh, uh, from this talk was uh, based off of uh, uh, an editorial stat asked me to write around uh, the investment within the microbiome space. And the data you see here was collected, again, uh, about most of the way through 2019, uh, looking at investments uh, from the VC community within companies developing a microbiome therapeutic. And you could see really the, the field took off around 2014, 2015, um, you know, with continued, um, you know, hundreds of million dollars investment going into uh, companies in the, um, in the subsequent year with uh, 2018 being a high watermark year. So what we've seen in the past couple of years looking at the data is a lot of this investment has continued um, at pace. Uh, so despite the pandemic, you know, money continues to flow into the space um, across uh, therapeutic areas and types of companies, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, in a couple of slides. Again, the 2022 number, um, that's about through halfway through the year, so it'll be interesting to see uh, uh, where that number lands for 2022. But again, um, given the uh, mood out there in the market, uh, potentially not too surprising uh, that that could be a flat line uh, for the trailing few years. So a lot of what I just presented was on the therapeutic side, turning to, you know, putting that in context to the diagnostic and supplement field, obviously, it takes a lot more money uh, to take a, a prescription medicine all the way through the clinic, so it's not surprising that you see a heck of a lot more investment uh, in companies pursuing that approach. Um, but, you know, when compared to diagnostic and supplements, you know, not too surprising the, the numbers in aggregate are lower, but also on a per-company financing basis, you do see a lot of activity um, in those companies as well. So 
drilling in the type of the companies that are being invested in and where people are, are sort of deploying money. Um, you know, if we think about the world for, in a, for a company developing a microbiome-based product, you could think about it as, you know, a live bacteria approach where the bug is the drug, or a non-bacterial approach where it's either a small molecule that tries to recapitulate the biology um, of a specific uh, bug or group of bugs uh, in the human body, or a phage or another approach to sort of targeted, um, uh, targeted to take out a specific species of bug. Looking back over the um, you know, previous few years, 2019 pre-pandemic, Prior, you know, the money was pretty much evenly split between the two approaches, um, bacteria and non-bacteria, with 2018 seeing sort of a blip in um, interest and funding and companies taking the non-bacterial approach. We sort of split that out with where the money's been going lately. Um, so the pie chart on the upper left sort of looks at pre-2019 money. Um, you know, evenly split between bacteria and non-bacteria approaches. What's interesting is, is given where some of the data was going in 2018, um, you know, there seems to be a lot of money now going into the bacteria-based approaches. And then if you sort of drill in to, you know, you can divide the world uh, in any number of different ways for bacterial-based approaches, but thinking about it, you know, in these four categories, either donor-derived, uh, approaches like FMT, um, engineered bacteria, which we'll be hearing about uh, in a couple minutes from Eric, and either monoculture or multi-species consortia approaches. Um, you know, early on, and not surprisingly, you saw a lot of investment in single-strain uh, approaches, which now seems to be moving towards more complex uh, consortia-based approaches. So looking at where the state of clinical development has been within the microbiome, uh, what we did was sort of look at, at all the companies and all the nominated clinical assets within those companies and looking at the indications at which they were pursuing, um, you know, and broadly categorizing them across um, these half a dozen or so um, therapeutic areas. Not surprisingly, given where some of the early data within the microbiome was generated in the clinic. Not too surprising that many of the early development um, was and has been within the gastrointestinal um, and GI um, spaces, as well as those targeting uh, infectious disease, the larger, largest indication of which being um, you know, C. diff. But obviously, given the breadth of the microbiome's impact on disease pathology, a lot of interest in, in other spaces as well, from um, oncology all the way down to rare diseases and metabolic diseases. And to a greater or lesser extent, a lot of that has, has, has borne out. So if we sort of look at the companies uh, that have undergone a private financing raise of over about one to two million, and look at where their lead asset was positioned and which indication they were going after, you know, historically, the vast majority of those have been going after uh, GI um, and infectious disease indications. If we look in the past couple of years, a lot of that now has shifted to some extent. Certainly, there's a continued interest in GI and infectious disease, um, you know, but an increasing diversity in, of investment um, across the space well beyond um, sort of the traditional uh, gut and infectious disease-based approaches. And I'll be talking about a couple of those areas in, in a few slides where we've been seeing a lot of, of partner interest and a lot of companies uh, coming to us for uh, advice with respect to uh, development, commercialization, partnering, and, and financing. Uh, not to bring the mood down too much, but just a quick comment about the public markets. Uh, and the companies that have gone uh, uh, public in the last couple of years. Um, again, not a lot of those companies have graduated to the public markets. What's interesting, if you look at some of these companies um, and sort of compare to where they were at their time of their IPO relative to peer groups, um, you know, they were much more advanced in the clinic relative to a lot of the other um, IPOs that we were seeing across uh, the biopharma space um, writ large. A um, couple of these companies have since had some 
um, either uh, uh, clinical or strategic uh, hiccups along the way. Um, but, you know, suffice to say, some of them are still, you know, were able to raise a decent amount of capital during their initial uh, um, uh, IPO. So if we turn now from the capital markets to where the, a lot of the activity has been on the transactional space, uh, so we looked at, at licensing, partnering, uh, collaboration, M&A deals over the past five years or so um, across a broad array of, of, of type of agreements from uh, licensing and partnering of technologies, uh, pursuing a traditional therapeutic approach to diagnostic deals, consumer-based um, partnerships, as well as more early stage R&D or platform research-based um, technologies. So as you saw on the previous slide, there's been sort of a continued interest with, you know, 20 to 30 uh, deals over the past five years in each, de uh, in each year. On the left side of this graph, if you look at the uh, therapeutic space, again, not surprisingly, given the state of the field and the relatively nascent uh, nature of many of these companies, a lot of the deals are very early on, most of them licensing and partnering, um, you know, very few, if any, uh, mergers or M&A uh, deals within the space. If you look on the, and these are the therapeutics uh, on the left, if you look at the right, a lot of the company is also developing either diagnostic approaches, consumer-based uh, technologies as well. A lot of these have been um, in the realm of licensing and partnering rather than full full takeout, suggesting again, for some of the larger consolidators, they've been, um, you know, slow to jump in with, with two feet into the space, but rather accessing the technology uh, through partnerships. Again, this is a very busy uh, slide, so apologies to uh, uh, those of you in the back uh, who don't have a magnifying glass or binoculars, uh, but just the sense of who's been active um, in the space, again, not too surprising for those of you that have been following the field. Uh, some of the larger companies that have publicly stated they have a very um, concerted interest in the space, uh, from Faring, Janssen, Takeda, um, uh, making multiple deals within the space. And then interestingly enough, you know, a lot of the smaller, spa uh, a lot of the smaller companies in the space, um, you know, doing collaborative deals. Um, to access complementary technologies uh, that can help facilitate uh, development of their technologies. So looking at the um, you know, values of some of the uh, deals within the space, again, two things sort of jump out. Not surprisingly, uh, given that uh, this technology is at the forefront of, um, of clinical development, you know, a lot of them are highly structured, a lot of them are early, and interestingly, or maybe not interestingly, depending on your perspective, mainly focused on, you know, inflammatory GI diseases. Again, a lot of the consolidators with larger balance sheets that you see here uh, have a strong interest um, in their GI uh, and auto-inflammatory uh, franchises. Therefore, a lot of the collaborations you'll see in and around uh, IBD, but a couple interesting, um, um, you know, names popping up with respect to indications beyond GI, be it, you know, fibrosis, respiratory, uh, with the Janssen and Gilead deal. So casting a net with these uh, deals, sort of where they're focused from a um, therapeutic area, uh, perspective, um, obviously GI and infectious disease, given uh, what we reviewed earlier, um, one of the more active areas, but wanted to just highlight, you know, as we're beginning to work with uh, not only investment groups to help them qualify their interest in uh, new companies, as well as sort of the flow we're seeing from early stage companies uh, uh, looking to put a fine point on their um, business plan, wanted to highlight two areas uh, uh, that we've seen a lot of interest in, that's uh, dermatology and women's health. Uh, so as many of you wait, uh, may know, you know, there's been a strong association for many years, not only um, 
in areas where the bacteria is part of the pathogenesis of the disease, such as acne, uh, but also in areas where it's been uh, implicated in a broader multifactorial disease like atopic dermatitis or psoriasis. So there's been a long association between the microbiome and um, in dermal diseases. Um, and as I said earlier, you know, historically a lot of the partnering activity has been relegated to the GI, IBD uh, space. But you know, what jumped out when we were doing this analysis for uh, an investment group was the, um, you know, some of the names popping up uh, that historically haven't had a huge interest uh, in the microbiome, or at least a huge interest stated publicly, you know, such as GSK or Sanofi beginning to get uh, interested in accessing technologies in the microbiome. Um, one other area is uh, also women's health. Increasingly, we've been seeing people um, not only begin to develop business plans around uh, the concept of a women's health franchise, um, but also you know, looking to understand where uh, the microbiome has been implicated in a, in a broad array of, of, of diseases. And I see that I have 28 seconds left, so I'll just quickly say there's a wide area of different diseases, all the way from things like IVF to endometriosis um, and other inflammatory diseases that people are looking at. Um, um, uh, to build a business case around, and it's an area that is, you know, of interest for us for a variety of reasons, but um, we're starting to see a lot of early stage development and interest in this space. I'll skip the next slide in the interest of time, but just, you know, why, why Back Bay and someone like us or a U.S. investor is interested in the microbiome broadly, but also, you know, Medicon Valley is, as we're advising clients for what they need to put together, for an investable story, all the way from a sound scientific hypothesis, all the way through to you know the business plan, I would say you know here at the MVA there's access to all the necessary competencies, all the way from early R and D to self-servingly the sort of uh, 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 advice and uh, support that a consultancy and a transaction advisor like Backbay can um, can provide. So I'll end with this shameless ad slide uh, and just uh, thank again the organizers for inviting me and I'll uh, take any questions as time permits. Thank you so much, Peter. Thanks. And I really enjoy seeing your slide about Medicon Valley, of course. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I was speaking over lunch with some researchers who are here actually to really learn what it means to commercialize a, their product down the road. What would be your single most important piece of advice to them to start thinking even now before they start entering the industry? Sure, well, the, the single piece of advice is to start thinking about it. Uh, and I think that goes a, a long way. And, and, you know, what we find, and this goes just beyond the microbiome, when we're advising, you know, clients in, in, in Europe and other ex-US geographies that are interesting in speaking to a US investor or speaking to a partner with a... U.S. footprint is really, you know, understand the U.S. market, right? And it doesn't ha I know that sounds very um, self-evident, but, um, you know, if, you're ho if your product is going to be used in the hospitals, right, understand how products are reimbursed in the hospitals in the United States, which can be very, very different um, and sometimes have very strange, um, uh, you know, the way they're reimbursed can have very strange implications. Um, to pricing and, and market access and to just, you know, understand that going in. You don't have to have all the answers, mm. you know, if you're looking at a preclinical technology, but, you know, have a working understanding um, of the, the, uh, the structures and paradigm under which your technology is going to be used in the markets um, that you're interested in. Mm. Um, and it, you give a really good overview of, you know, what's happening in the space. And, you, of course, you touched briefly on, on Medicon Valley. But when you're meeting these companies, European, U.S. and Scandinavian countries, do you, companies, do you see something sticking out with Scandinavian companies that make us exceptional in a good way or in a maybe not so good way that we should kind <laughs> of <know>, consider? <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, so, so we work with a lot of, um, you know, Nordic companies. Um, the 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 science is always, you know, second to none or bar none or 
or great, uh, you know, and I, I think, um, you know, there's a very, uh, um, you know, inherent sense of modesty from a lot of the scientific advisors that, uh, or scientific founders that we, uh, that we hear from, and that's contrasted uh, certainly with where we sit in, in Boston, where every researcher rolls out of bed and can raise a $60 million Series A. Um, you know, and I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing, but, um, you know, not only knowing the market, you know, but also having a, a you know, not selling yourself short mm. as far as the, the quality of the science or the quality of technology, um, you know, because as we see it from an investment standpoint, you know, there's a huge arbitrage opportunity given the company's valuations that we see here, you know, and hopefully the exit multiples for an investor should be, you know, equal on the back end if mm. developed properly. Mm. So for our nine pitching companies, take that to heart and put on your thick skin today. We'll be able to stand on your signs. But thank you so much, Peter. You'll be around during the break. Oh, yeah. We can yep. catch you for more conversations. Yeah. So let's give Peter okay. one more round of thank applause. You. Thank you so much. Now I'm very proud to welcome Eric van der Helm on stage. Eric is Vice President and Scientific Affairs, Bioinformatics and Automation at Snyberbiome. Snyberbiome focusing on the microbiome modulating using the CRISPR technology. Eric joined Sniper approximately five years ago at the start of the company here in Denmark, or over there in Denmark, sorry. <laughs> 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 but uh, they also have office in uh, UK and as well as in uh, Boston, US. Eric, you will tell us about the very successful journey and accomplishments of Sniper, and perhaps some of the few bumps that you might have experienced. Many. on the way. <laughs> Please welcome Eric. Take it away. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> um, thanks for, for organizing this. Thanks for inviting us to, to share the story of Sniper. Um, I only have 10 minutes, so if I have to talk about all the bumps in the road, uh, we'll still here till, uh, till the drinking session. Um, so no, I'll, I'll just try to keep it, keep it short. Um, and just very briefly, what is, what is Sniper Biome? So we're the leaders and pioneering CRISPR in the microbial gene therapy space. Um, and we're the first company to dose uh, humans orally with a CRISPR therapeutic. Um, we have a hi highly experienced management team. Our R&D pipeline is geared towards unmet medical needs. And we are backed by uh, a group of, uh, of very exciting uh, VCs. So this is really, in a nutshell, Sniper Biome. Um, and I think a lot of you want to know, what do we then actually do? What if you lift the hood of the, of the engine room? What is going on there? That is shown in this slide. So our CRISPR technology is programmable and selective. And what I mean by that is we can, how computer programmers write code, we can, um, as many of you know, write DNA. So with DNA, you can actually program a CRISPR system. And a CRISPR system is a system that can specifically make double-stranded breaks in DNA. And how we at, at Sniper uh, utilize that is shown on the cartoon on the right-hand side. So in, in red, you see a, a bacterium. And this bacterium can be in your gut, can be on your skin, but it's a bacterium you don't want to have. What we can do is we can put together a CRISPR system that you see in this, this hairpin uh, CRISPR array, this, this red, uh, red icon, together with a CAS. And the CAS is a, is a guided nuclease. So this nuclease will make a double-stranded break the moment um, it, it hits the sequence complementarity. And then you ask, which sequence complementarity? And that comes in with the red part. So this is an array that we design the sequence complementarity to this red bacterium you want to remove. So if you put it all together, if you get that CRISPR system in the pathogen sequence complementarity, you make a double-stranded break and then the cell dies. And that's exactly what you want, because 
if this system enters a commensal bacterium, a good bacterium, a bacteria in your gut or in your skin or anywhere else that you would like to preserve, this sequence complementarity does not exist and the bacteria survives. So this is just um, really zoomed in on the concepts that we, that we set out five years ago to, uh, to commercialize. Um, on the left-hand side, you, you see even more technical, what is a CRISPR system? There, there are different genes, um, there are different arrays that you see on the left-hand side, uh, and these all form this, um, this machinery. So this is just to demystify a bit what, what are we actually doing, what is, uh, what, what is Sniper all about. And I promised Camilla um, to talk about our journey. How did we come, we're on the other side of the, of the bridge, how did we come uh, to the stage where we're currently at? So I put together this, this timeline and it starts out in, uh, in 2015 um, where the company was, uh, was started up in the UK and the first patents uh, were filed. And this is, and I'll come back to this, this is one of the key things uh, that, that really made Sniper a success, that's the, the patent portfolio. With that, uh, with that patent estate, um, we then went out to raise our first round of, of seed funding. Um, and we, we were extremely lucky to, uh, to partner up with the Lundbeck Foundation. Um, and this foundation has a, has a long investment horizon. And they really believed in the technology that, that we pitched, as, as many of you are here, how to use CRISPR to modulate, to change human microbiomes. So they provided us with a, um, with a 20 million Danish kroner seed funding. Uh, and with that money, we then focused on in vivo data. So as you can see in the timeline, 2015 was, was a moment where we had patents, patents based on in vitro data. And with this, uh, with this funding, we wanted to push to the next level and generate in vivo data. And with in vivo data, I mean um, experiments that we can do in uh, animals, in our case in mice and mini pigs, where we can show that this concept of taking out the bad bug while leaving in the good ones uh, actually, um, actually holds. So that's where we spent uh, 2017, uh, 2018 on in, in taking these concepts that we had um, into, the, into the animal models. And with, on the back of that data, uh, we then went out to pitch, um, pitched a lot. Um, and I think um, and that resulted in a in 50 million uh, US uh, dollar Series A round. And when Camilla asked me just now again, what are the bumps in the road? I mean, yes, uh, there's a great, great financing round and it, uh, it, it, it enabled us to, to go where we are now. But it was not easy. It's not that um, it, 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 it happened like this, and there was the, the syndicate of investors, and there we had the biggest uh, Series A in, in Scandinavia. I mean, that you can see this from this timeline, that it took us two years to, to generate the data, to make the contact, to go out. It doesn't happen in one meeting, doesn't happen in two meetings. There's a lot of, uh, there are lo there, there are a lot of dialogues involved to get there. So just also as a... Uh, uh, to this audience, if you, you're, you're pitching out now, um, but don't be discouraged if you get a no. Um, I mean that, sure, a no is a no, but then always ask why, what's, what, what, because there's a lot of feedback, there's a lot you can learn. And um, if you see our, our business plan that we wrote in 15 to where we're now, I mean, you can say that glass is half full, the glass is half empty. You, you'll see a lot of things that are similar that we set out in 15 that we're still doing. We're still using CRISPR. We're still going after unmet medical needs. Um, but, but under the hood, there are also a lot of things that we evolved our thinking around. Uh, we, 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 uh, we also read the scientific literature. We of course try to, to constantly innovate. Um, that also then led us actually to... Um, um, to be awarded Entrepreneur of the Year uh, later in 2019 by EY. Um, and then going to 2020, the nomination of our first development candidate. And what that means is that um, in, in, uh, in 19, we've shown in vivo proof of concept that it works. Um, and then in, uh, in 20, we actually have a complete, we had a complete data package um, that is also convincing enough for the FDA to show um, that with a CRISPR-armed 
phage cocktail, you can actually remove these bad bugs in the, in the microbiome of, uh, of patients. So that was nominated in, uh, in, in 2020. And um, later in the year, we also were awarded uh, grant support from CARP-X for Sniper 001. So that's our, our, our lead program. Um, and again there, it's great, 10 million uh, dollars that we can use to actually uh, put this uh, Sniper 01 into the clinic. Um, but again, that was also a lot of work. It, um, the, I, I looked back in my mailbox uh, yesterday and my first conversations with CARPEX started in 18. So that has also been a process of, of two years um, to, 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 to get where we are now. So I think again, it's uh, um, don't give up too easily. Um, in the end, there is, uh, there is sometimes a, God of pot, a, a pot of gold at the end of the, uh, the rainbow. Um, the rainbow also led us to, uh, to a bit north of Copenhagen, uh, to Novo Nordisk, um, and we have a very good dialogues um, with, uh, with this large pharma player around how can, uh, can, uh, can a company like Novo Nordisk use gene therapy of the microbiome, um, and how, wh what's the synergy with, with our technology there. So, we had a lot of discussions um, with, with, with Novo Nordisk, and we um, we settled on a uh, on an agreement where we are developing uh, a first uh, prototype that can be used um, by Novo Nordisk. So that is again where when we talk about partnering, um, take some time, but it's really great once you have the right people in the room. Once you really see that the information starts flowing, you can really create synergies and, and one plus one becomes becomes three literally in, the, in these conversations. Um, one plus one also comes to 30 seconds that I have left. So I'll, uh, I'll skip to the end of the timeline. Where, where are we currently? Uh, Sniper 001 is currently in, in clinical trials. Uh, it's in the phase one trial in the US. Um, and I haven't mentioned what we're actually doing. Um, we're using a cocktail of CRISPR armed phages um, to modulate the microbiome of cancer patients. So these cancer patients uh, have are at increased risk of having E. coli translocate from their gut microbiome into their bloodstream. Um, and our proposal is that if you preemptively remove E. coli from the GI tract, then these patients will have a reduction in the occurrence of E. coli jumping from the gut into the bloodstream. Currently, it's done with antibiotics, but these bugs are getting more and more resistant, hence the interest of CARP-X. So our proposition is really to, to make the life better for these, uh, for these cancer patients. So that's currently ongoing. Data readout will be uh, in the end of the year. So um, I'm, I'm very excited to update you uh, after Christmas on uh, on the data that comes out of this. Um, so four keys to success, to round it off. Ground rating technology, protection of technology, teamwork, and great investors to back you up. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Eric. What is an exciting journey that you've been on. Tough one as well. Yes. <laughs> but thinking about all the ones sitting here, the startups. Mm. If you should give a single most important piece of advice ah. to a microbiome startup going global. Going global. What would that be? Well, I just had, like, I flashed these four on the screen, right? Um, <laughs> if I have to pick one, I think I would go for IP. I can, and of course, I, I, I'm not going to generalize. I'm, I'm just going to speak from my experience at Sniper. Just by the fact that we have such a broad IP portfolio, I didn't show the slides, but we currently have 21 granted patents uh, and 110 <laughs> pending. Um, that costed a lot of money to do that. <laughs> um, really a lot of money. Yeah. But it's also the key differentiator for us when we go out and speak with different parties uh, that really sets us apart. So. Uh -huh. And that's why I'm not going to generalize. I think you should think about that if that's part of your strategy as a company, as an early stage company. Um, but for us, that worked extremely well to just be very focused and always start with the question, can we protect this? 
if we go out with this, do we have freedom to operate um, and build build our business around that uh, that concept? Excellent. Thank you very much. Thanks. Please give Eric a big round of applause. <laughs> so now. I can almost hear the pounding hearts of our pitching companies now since we're moving into the next phase. And I see that the jury members suddenly got extremely alert. So now they will watch out for any opportunity to invest and forget about all mistakes these pitching companies will potentially do. But a word of advice, have fun, share your passion, be genuine, Talk from your heart, talk from your science, and it will be all great. It was also very fun to hear Peter Back's uh, words a little bit earlier here, where he actually highlighted the, uh, the uh, interest in women's uh, health. I would also say that that is a specifically strong area, also in Medicon Valley, where we see a lot of things happening in this space. And I'm very pleased to see that one of our giants in the area was just entering the, uh, the conference room before the pitching started. So I think that would be a uh, fantastic opportunity for the pitches here. So by that, I would like to uh, welcome up Uvisa Health, Ella Harris, the CEO and, and co-founder. So please, Ella. Thank you for the introduction. Hi everybody, my name's Ella, and as just introduced, I am the founder um, and CEO of Uvisa. And we are <laughs> not working on the, let's try that again. There we go. We are an ambitious femtech on a mission to empower women globally by offering them non-pharmacological solutions to their most intimate health needs. Starting with the problem of vaginitis. Vaginitis is characterized as pain, itching, discomfort, and unpleasant discharge of the vagina and around the vagina. Now, this issue recurrently affects around a billion people worldwide annually. To put that into context, that's a third of all women get this issue again and again. It's most commonly caused by bacterial and fungal infections. And it, unfortunately, there is no long-term cure for this condition as it can arise any time the vaginal pH changes, which it does naturally as women's hormones fluctuate, and for many other reasons, which makes it not only difficult to manage, but also actually can lead to some very severe health complications. Untreated bacterial infections can lead to an increased risk of infertility, as well as an increased risk of contracting other STIs such as HIV, as well as pelvic inflammatory disease and miscarriage and preterm birth during pregnancy. So back in 2019, the annual global burden of treating bacterial vaginosis alone was estimated to be 4.8 billion US dollars. That's not even factoring in the other conditions or all of those secondary health conditions that I've just mentioned. Therefore, we are developing a small, insertable, therapeutic treatment device that will use safe wavelengths of light to alter the microbiome. By lowering the concentration of the microbes, what we can do, uh, what we predict is that the good commensal bacteria that are the dominant species would actually then be able to repopulate. Um, we have filed our first patent on the note of IP and have just received a very positive search result from the European Patent Office for this device design, which includes a column of light in the center with an expandable casing. So that actually will increase the surface area exposed to the light after the device has been inserted. And whilst this might seem a bit strange to some, actually the use of light has been used in many contexts already and is already approved for many uh, dermatological applications. Recently as well, we've also seen publications in the literature where light has been used very successfully in the gut microbiome uh, to treat Helicobacter, for example. Longer term, we also plan to move into the diagnostic space and include some health tracking sensors, enabling us to uh, identify infections before symptoms become problematic and treat them. But right now, we're focusing on the MVP, 
which is the treatment device. And so right now we are most up against uh, over-the-counter antifungals and prescription antibiotics. Antifungals are somewhat effective if you're treating a fungal infection, but two out of three women purchasing them are actually experiencing a bacterial infection. And for that, really the only treatment available right now is antibiotics. These are often systemic, broad spectrum, and therefore cause a host of horrible side effects. And that isn't even to mention the antibiotic resistance which is occurring for about 50% of those women that get this recurrent problem because they're just taking them monthly, which is causing real issues with their system. So we are developing the first non-pharmacological solution um, which will target both fungal and bacterial infections, meaning that the end user doesn't actually need to know what's causing this condition for an effective and quick treatment. It's localized, which means that there is no horrible side effects and no resistance, um, hopefully. Uh, we're aiming to offer this as a single treatment, which makes it much, much faster than the five to 14 days that medications take to work. And it's reusable, making it more sustainable and more cost effective in the long run. We've spoken to almost 700 women, and of those, 91% are open to using this product, providing it is safe and effective. Based on this, and the prevalence of the conditions in our target markets of Scandinavia, Germany, and the UK alone, if we could obtain even 50% of the people currently using those medications, that gives us an obtainable market of almost 7 million customers. Of course, we ex we plan and we hope to become a global company where that obtainable market is actually almost 600 million potential users. We're currently in our preclinical research phase and we started very early on with the hypothesis that the vaginal microbes would be much, much more susceptible to light than general bacteria that is exposed to sunlight in general. And so we're demonstrating here on the slide that we first took some Lactobacillus plantarum, which was from a soil sample. And we plated it, and we exposed it to various doses of light. And you can see that it continued to grow quite, uh, quite well. We did the same with Group B Streptococcus, which was taken from a vaginal sample. And we can demonstrate here that the growth was dramatically inhibited by the light. We're also looking very much at safety from the start, because safety is of paramount concern for us as well. And our initial safety study using 365 nanometers against human vaginal epithelial reconstructed tissue gave us a very good uh, initial safe range of light to work in. So we actually saw no cell damage up to 12 joules per centimeter squared. So based on all of this research and some very, very good advisors, we have a planned go-to-market strategy taking us to about 2026. So we're still focusing on preclinical research at the moment, aiming to go into our first pilot study at the start of 2024 um, and submitting to the notified body by 2025. A shorter timeline than many of you in the traditional therapeutic space, but still quite a long one for the most traditional uh, startups. We plan to have a retail business model where we initially sell to pharmacies and health retailers at a price point of around 200 kroner, Danish kroner, uh, per unit. We know that customers would be happy to pay anywhere between 500 to 800 kroner. So uh, based on this and uh, just a very, very uh, conservative estimate of capturing just 1% to 2% in each of those markets in the first two years, it would give us a two-year revenue of almost 60 million Danish kroner. We're currently two co-founders, uh, myself, who uh, have a life science background with about 11 years of commercial business development and product management experience, and have recently completed a master's in technology entrepreneurship. And my co-founder, Gizem, who is a microbiologist um, with various experience in cell tissue culture and other things. We are supported by some fantastic advisors as well, both in the medical space and the business space, including you know, people from the Staten Serum Institute, photonics professors from uh, DTU, and gynecologists, of course. And we are now looking to talk to investors who uh, would like to take part in our first pre-seed round. Thank you very much.
Very interesting indeed, and uh, something completely new in the in the scene as well. Uh, I know that uh, there are some companies here that are also focusing in this area, so it will be very interesting in the end of the day to see the different approaches. But I would like to ask the jury whether you have any questions to Ella. You can have the mic on the table there, so, yep. Okay. Ella, thank you very much. That was a really nice presentation. Um, I wanted just to question you on your clinical, or preclinical, I should say, preclinical evidence that this will work. So when you take a bacterium on a Petri dish, um, you can show resilience to the light or susceptibility, but in situations of bacterial vaginosis, you have very rich mucus layers, biofilms, and they're polymicrobial. So have you any evidence to show that this therapy will target just the bad guys and, importantly, leave bugs like Crispatus viable? Yeah, so the actual idea was based on research conducted between DTU and KU, which was looking at bacteria in a biofilm state. And that showed very promising results that UV, A, light, uh, destroys the bacteria in a biofilm state. And we are actually moving into more microbiome, well, not microbiome, but biofilm uh, studies ourselves in the near-term future as well. And our chief scientific officer is here to discuss that further later if people want to know more details. Thank you. And a question from, from me as well here. Thank you very much. Nice presentation. So considering safety with these devices, apparently the, um, the patient can self-administer light. Uh, Long-term use, UV effects. I noticed that you are in the UV domain of, of radiation, cancerous. Or are you going to make sure that you are not inducing, at least increasing the risk of cell-induced oncology? Yeah, so UVA radiation is the radiation that's actually in natural sunlight. So we're exposed to it all of the time anyway. And the body has a really great way of repairing itself. So similarly to sunbathing, we can go out and get a safe dose of sunlight. And we can do that actually daily as long as we then come out of the sunlight and, prepare and repair ourselves. So we assume it's exactly the same in the vagina. There is a safe dose that can be used, and it can be used repeatedly, providing that there is time to recover in between. And so what we're looking at with our safety studies right now is that safe dose. What can we administer each time, and how long between sessions do we need? If I may continue on that, um, because I can imagine that women who have uh, severe uh, BV that they actually want to get rid of it and really start overexposing themselves. So there's a safety risk there. Um, you also mentioned retail market. So combining these two, why are you choosing for a retail market and not a, a market where at least a gynecologist can observe the effects and monitor the, the patient in this case? Yeah, so we also we plan a retail model eventually. We also plan to be an approved medical device, which means that we have to go through clinical testing. So it will first be used in a gynecological setting, administered by gynecologists. Later, it will be taken to market as a consumer device. And with regards to women getting excited and overexposing themselves, that comes down to usage instructions. And as long as we make sure that we are very clear on our usage instructions, similar to drugs. I mean, you know, you can say to somebody, don't take a whole packet of uh, paracetamol, but if somebody really wants to do harm, then they will. So, but as long as you write it down very clearly, please only use it in this way, then, uh, then we hope that that won't be the case. Thank you, Alain. One short question on you one. Yeah, just, uh, you mentioned the price or the, the idea on the price, but you have an idea already today on cost of goods and manufacturing. We do, and we believe that at scale, we'll be producing the device for around 80 kroner uh, per unit. Potentially less, actually. That was a, some initial costings we did a while ago, but obviously we're still in, in the product development phase, so things are inevitably going to change. Thank you, Ella. Fantastic. Thank you. A really great start. And uh, one other thing that I would like to mention, we are very, very proud that actually the majority of the ones pitching here today are actually women, which you don't typically see in the biotech sphere or in the life science. So I'm really, really pleased to uh, present the next uh, pitching company, and that is Celsius Biopharma by Alexandra Elevik. So please, Alexandra. Is this the... Yeah. 
So stress, inadequate diets and sedentary lifestyle, all these factors uh, disables or uh, disrupts the equilibrium in the microbiome. And if this proceeds for a long time, it can also actually transform into uh, chronic conditions. But so, oops, sorry. Uh, chronic conditions, and these chronic conditions can be expressed as, a, as a, um, sorry, as a, uh, <laughs> diseases such as overweight, uh, obesity, uh, pre-diabetes, diabetes type 2, for example, and in worst case scenario, colon cancer. Um, Celsius has developed a technology platform that can actually deliver various uh, nutritional supplements to the microbiome and therefore may prevent or prohibit uh, development of these chronic uh, conditions. My name is Alexandra Elevik and uh, I'm the CEO of Celsius and uh, uh, I will take some minutes here to present a bit closer about the company. So the team behind the company is, uh, uh, or it's founded 2020, and uh, Olof Steiner was one of the uh, um, initiatives of the project. It's not, he's not pictured here on the slide, together with Margareta Nyman, who's a professor at the Nutritional Food Engineering uh, Department at the Engineering Faculty at Lund University, together with Martin Johansson, who is Associate Professor uh, with 20 years of experience in life science and our CMC expert. And then we have Kristin Wiesdand, who is Ellie Holdings um, uh, representative in our board, and she has vast com experience in building up these life science, small life science companies. And uh, also this summer, we have a great pleasure to have uh, Hannah Sjöström included in our board. And she has a vast in, in experience in, in marketing and launching different kind of products for multinational companies, such as Coca-Cola and L'Oreal. Uh, and we also have Gunbrit Fransson in our board. She's been um, CEO at Proby and uh, long many years uh, working at sea level at Orkla, which is a big, huge uh, food producer company here in Scandinavia. And myself, uh, I uh, will put in, uh, I've been in, uh, in the project management, uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm expert in project management, uh, business development and, uh, and marketing. And uh, during my time in Rovac, which is a traded company, pharmaceutical company, I've been involved in the investor relation and uh, communication. So what is the challenge? The challenge is to deliver the products to the microbiome in the colon because it's a nasty and quite uh, challenging environment in the GI tract. So, for example, it has to pass the stomach with pH 1, and then it has to go through the small intestine, which is coated with enzymes, and the enzymes' only feature is to break everything down into small bits and pieces until it reaches the colon and the mode of action. But Celsius has developed a technology platform that enables a slow and targeted release of various nutritional supplements, uh, which we can provide the micro, uh, microbiome in the colon. And uh, we have emphasized our uh, research on, on the nutritional supplements called short-chain fatty acids, and specifically on the butyrate. And why do we focus on butyrates? Uh, it is naturally produced in the microbiome uh, when it's fermenting undigestible fibers that we are eating. And then using this uh, butyrate as a, one of the major uh, energy sources. It is also a very important building block on, uh, in the colonocytes that keeps the, the gut wall intact from the outside. And also it has anti-inflammatory effects. Of, uh, uh, and, uh, and promotes the, the innate immune system in the gut. 
So Celsius has performed preclinical trials and uh, got the proof of concept. And uh, these green bars in the diagram shows that we actually can deliver the butyrate through all the GI tract, but they are a bit overshooting. We didn't calibrate the dosages in this experiment, but we are going to do that in the future. Further analysis of this preclinical trial showed also that we had an increased diversity of our uh, microbiome after only five days of uh, diet, uh, eating this uh, diet. So what is the challenge with the short-chain fatty acids? It's that they smell rancid in uh, different ways. And uh, it's, it's a challenge. But we, when we couple our, the, the, the short-chain fatty acids to our carrier molecule, we receive a tasteless and an odorless uh, powder that we can use and uh, distribute in a more uh, nice way. <laughs> Um, if you look at the microbiome market, the total uh, microbiome market, it's estimated to reach uh, just above 100 billion US dollar by 2024 and with a growth rate of 8.5%. Uh, um, and uh, we estimate that we could have a po potential take of the market about pro approximately 10% of it by reaching out to big food producers. Uh, uh, which is our uh, business to business model then. And uh, the plan is to, th these, uh, these food producers are actually committed to produce more healthy uh, foods for the cons consumers, uh, and not only by cutting down sugar contents, for example, but they're also looking for more health beneficiary uh, values to add into their, uh, to their products, such as immunostrengthening. Uh, uh, features. And uh, uh, we are now looking for an investment for 250,000 uh, euros, almost 60 million, as uh, Peter um, mentioned. Uh, and uh, we, we had the plan uh, for, the, for those money of the next coming 12 months, we are planning to uh, step up the business development. We are also planning of doing a pilot batch upscale um, to see what challenges we are, are awaiting us uh, when we are stepping up the, the production. And we are also doing some verification studies on our product, including toxicology studies. And then that's the investment round is uh, expected to be uh, mid next year. Uh, so we raise money for a clinical trial in healthy subjects. So we can see if we uh, have a proof of concept in humans. And then we see a potential exit opportunity after the clinical trial in, in, um, uh, after that. And then this is a quite quick summary of it. We, we know there is a great um, health need of it because we know that the majority of the world has adopted the Western lifestyle and that's not a good thing with all the lifestyle diseases uh, carrying on. High customer demand. We know also that these uh, uh, food producers are scouting around and trying to find healthy additives to put in their foods. And we also know that we have an attractive business model because it's quite easy to uh, scale up the, uh, the, the, the platform. And proven benefits, the research is, um, is established and I would say undisputable regarding when it comes to short chain fatty acids. And then we have this excellent uh, and highly experienced team which will uh, take us the whole way around. And thank you for your attention and then looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Alexander. <laughs> I actually would like to take the opportunity. Have you been planning your clinical studies outside the Western world or how are you seeing that since you're mm. claiming that the impact is higher with other populations? Uh, no, I think we're going to keep uh, keep in uh, in the western, uh, western Safe, safely in home based Sweden yeah but i mean the, uh, yeah. we will probably have the higher uh, kind of um, uh, it will be the most adequate uh, results there okay thank you the jury yes, yes.
Thank you very much, Alexandra. It was excellent. I have to agree with you. Butyrate is probably the most spoke about metabolite that's made by the microbiome. Mm. But, um, I've got lots of questions, but I'm just going to stick to two. <laughs> okay. There's um, the first one really is, um, can you comment on your USP over other competitors that you're aware of in this field? Mm. And it obviously then links to the second question is, have you done a detailed FTO on your opportunity? Um, uh, the, uh, there is um, uh, butyrate capsules uh, in in the on the market right now, but when you go to their home pages, you can't see that they are can they can prove any effects. Uh, they don't show that their capsules are actually having any effects on the, on the consumer. Uh, they are just uh, pinpointing research in general. Uh, and uh, what what was the other? Uh, IP, yeah, yeah, yeah. We are, uh, we have initiated our uh, um, patent procedure, and we expect to have it granted by Q1 next year, the PCT phase. So we're we're on on the on the way. Yes. Grant granted or just under examination? Is it? Is it it's under examination it now. Okay. Mm. Mm. Uh, I, I'm not an expert on specific butyrate, so no. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I will turn it the other way. Is is your technology uh, kind of aimed to bring be a deliver for other uh, mm. nutritional aspects as well? Mm. So, uh, so butyrate is your first product, and then you can yeah, get the technology. Uh, um, our preclinical tests were done on the majority of the short chain fatty acids, uh, where butyrate is one of them but it's the most prominent and more imp most important of the short-chain fatty acids. So we have checked the, all the, the other short-chain uh, fatty acids as well and, and seen results on that. Uh, we haven't at this moment uh, kind of looked on other kind of nutritional supplements, not at this stage. Thank you, Alexandra. I think we'll break there. And uh, we have received uh, some questions uh, online as well. So it's actually just a quick, quick one, yes or yes. no. Is your technology a micro-encapsulation technology? No. No. So that's a good answer. Yeah. So <laughs> if the person raising this question would like to find out more, please use <laughs> our, uh, our question and answer session. But now it's really time to... to uh, Greet uh, yet another female entrepreneur and researcher, uh, Gut in Balance and Chloe Laurison. Please welcome. Thank you. Let's start with a little bit of water. So my name is uh, Hengame Chloe Larsen, and I have a PhD in uh, microbiology, and I am CEO and founder of the company One Health Garden Balance since 2018. So I am here to tell you about our fantastic finding that can revolutionary chronic diseases. So we have three patented products. We have a patented fecal microbiota transplantation in capsule form and in anemia form that can be handled by patients themselves at their home. And we also have a patented apparatus that can produce these products at the hospital. So the goal is that place this appara apparatus at the hospital so the hospitals can produce their own capsules uh, much more cheaper and effectively and um, improve the quality of uh, life of the patients. Mm. That goes too fast. <laughs> I goes the wrong way. Can I have help with this, maybe? <coughs> Thank you. How, how does that work? It's fast to think of it. OK, OK, that's nice. So the problem is there's no cure for irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, or patients infected with antibiotic resistance bacteria, such as Clostridium difficile. Annually, 858,000 people are suffering from these diseases and visiting the hospitals in Denmark. So we have patented fecal microbiota transplantation in capsule form and in anemia form that can be handled by patients themselves at their home. And we also have an apparatus that can produce these products that can be placed in the hospital, so the hospitals can produce them themselves much cheaper and effectively 
and also without any side effects that we have been proving with our product. So our product has been actually used in, uh, at Vilva Hospital since 2020, and we have shown 80% healing effect. So there is a paper uh, on the way that actually uh, includes 80 patients that uh, have been cured. Um, we showed 80% healing effect with this product with only one person. So a patient get one person and go home and feeling well. Our competitions are open biome, which have been existing since 2013. So for one person, capsules, 2,050 euro. And they require two persons to achieve 80% healing effect. So our price is 377 euro when it's produced in the hospital. And we require only one person. So it's 10 times cheaper, much more effective. The regulatory we use tissue act uh, in the hospital. That's what we have been using all the time since 2020 also. But the apparatus need to uh, be approved by FDA. So that's the feature. So the team consists of me. Uh, I'm a researcher in microbiology. And I have performed research since 2009 at the Status Serum Institute uh, on uh, microbiota and chronic diseases, such as uh, inflammatory bowel disease, in collaboration with hospitals. The advisory board uh, consists of Kim Heche, who is uh, having 30 years of experience, has a chairman and CEO. And we have uh, Jesper Kill, who have also over 30 years of experience, has an um, advisor, senior advisor at pharma industry. And we have Andreas Holst, who also have over 30 years of experience, uh, has a marketing and management in pharma industry. Has an extend team, I have uh, Andreas Monk Peterson, who is a research associate professor at gastro, uh, Department of the Gastroenterology and Microbiology. And we have uh, Morten Helms, who is a medical consultant at the Villoa Department of the Infection Disease. So these two are coming from Bilo Hospital. So the status is that we have this uh, patented capsule uh, that is published in, uh, in, uh, in US and Europe. And we have patented the uh, enema uh, and uh, apparatus that can produce these products. So uh, we have been successfully running tests since 2020 at Vilo Hospital and we are very, they are very satisfied with it. Um, and we are seeking half a million euro to finance a prototype of our apparatus that can be placed in the hospitals. So the goal is that with this money, we will first start to um, hire the force we need for marketing and management, and also selecting the company that can help us through uh, to build this uh, prototype and we will continue collaborating with the hospitals. There are so many potential in this product that we have to together uh, find by research. And uh, in the future, we want to do lots of workshop to get our product out internationally, uh, yeah, being at international conferences. So the vision is that uh, I myself have a Crohn's disease, severe Crohn's disease, and I want to help the people with these chronic diseases to have a life, a better quality of life, to be um, like all the other people going around without having so much problem, such as here, this lady, I know her. She have a, um, she have a severe Crohn's disease. Um, so improving her quality of life. And the goal is that democratizing fecal microbiota transplantation products so the hospitals can produce them themselves cheap and effectively without any side effects. And uh, in this way, they will be better used in the hospitals instead of having very expensive products that cannot be buy by the hospitals. So this is my, uh, this is my product. Yeah, thank you. I, I will uh, let, especially I think Michelle in there, disrupting big pharma sounded something that you would like to respond to. Uh, but actually, I have a question here from the, the audience. 
Uh, is there a cost for maintaining the uh, apparatus that you have? Um, yeah, there will be always. Um, there are uh, in the hospitals, I'm also having 10 years of experience in the hospital. They have many apparatus in a hospital to uh, performing all the clinical um, um, results you get whenever you go to the hospital, for instance, for a blood samples. Mm. So they're used to have these apparatus that uh, put, uh, that analyzing samples and so on. They know how to deal with it. That's uh, We call it in Denmark, Bianunica. that's medical lab technicians that know how to deal with this kind of apparatus. I think the, the question alludes to whether you see an after-sales market also yeah, for this yeah. specific... Yeah, also that, yeah. because I see... Now we, um, we had a conference two weeks ago where we could see that whole Europe using fecal microbiota transplantation to research and also healing patients with antibiotic resistance bacteria. So there is a market for it, and also in the US. Thank you. So, so you want? Yeah, I can start. Um, going to one of your initial slides, talking about efficacy, that you had 80% healing effect. Could you expand a little bit on that? I mean, how many was this, in what disease, how many patients? Is it? Yeah, it was a patient with uh, antibiotic resistance Clostridium difficile, and these are the patients that keep coming back because they have these uh, antibiotic resistance bacteria, they can't heal. So uh, the, um, there is a protocol that you have to give them uh, antibiotic the first two times, and if they come back again the third time, you have to give them the product, uh, fecal microbiota transplantation. So uh, that has been done on these patients. So the third time when they come back, they get one portion of uh, my product, and then they go home and they don't, 80% of them doesn't come back again. So they feel healed. There is... Um, there's no antibiotic uh, resistance bacteria, so they're doing fine. We have a patient that has been actually going back and forward in many years. Like she come back each, each month to getting a uh, treatment. With this product, she has been just in two times during the last more than half year. So she's very happy that she doesn't have to go to the hospital. We have to also remember these patients with antibiotic resistance bacteria, they have to be isolated. It's difficult to deal with them. You can't, you know, it's def affecting people around, uh, the healthcare people. Uh, it's very costly and, uh, yeah, it's, it's good to send them home. <laughs> yeah. Michelle? Yeah, excellent. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. And we do like disruptive technologies, by the way, so <laughs> that's a good part. Um, I actually wanted to have the same, or had the same question as Johan, but uh, let me move to another question I had, because I'm uh, aware this will be an ATMP product, and there's regulation around it, especially around quality control, quality assurance. Um, how do you test a product for its efficacy? If you just go into a random hospital, picking a random, whatever you call a healthy individual, where you start making FMT capsules, how do you control for efficacy how do you control for quality when you have a machine that just stamps out some of these capsules? I don't completely comprehend how it fits within the regulatory framework. Yes. Um, well, we have, um, when I mentioned this is a tissue act, uh, law we have to use is because we don't know 50% of microorganisms in the fecal microbiota transplantation. That's why it cannot be a drug. A drug is something that you can give and you can constant know what you have inside it. it this is uh, different, that's why it's tissue act. So um, we, give, we give this treatment to the patient, and you can see patient doesn't come back and heal. That's, we show that this is the 80% efficacy. So when you have apparatus, you can place the apparatus. The apparatus based on the same method I have been using these last couple years in the hospital. So it's actually the same process. But it's just, it would just go faster than you, instead of one person sitting manually doing that, it would be apparatus that producing maybe 1,000 capsules an hour. So, so you can still trace the efficacy because it's the same method, but just make it automatic. And then uh, you give it to the patient, you will see it works or not. Uh, so I assume that it should work when it's based on the same method I have been using these last couple of years. So, um, this, um, yeah, I, 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 see, I see this apparatus being placed in uh, many hospitals, international, and curing patients like myself. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you. I think we will have to break there, but uh, you have received a lot of questions also from the audience, so I think there will be opportunity for you guys that are here online to 
go and see Chloe to discuss more, and also for the other presenters that will be standing here outside in the small tables. So thank you so much, Chloe. Thank you. So it seems like there's, of course, a lot of interest in our pitching companies. And as makers say, please take the opportunity to speak to them during the break. And we'll see you back here at uh, 3 o'clock sharp, where we'll go into our next three pitching companies. So welcome back at 3 o'clock.
On? Am I on? I can't hear myself. I'm on now. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear myself. Thank you. Hi, everyone, and uh, welcome back to the next group of pitches. We we'll just get the last ones to sit down. <laughs> And we will now move on to our next presenter, Lisa Tammy, the CEO and founder of Mello. Please give her a big hand of applause. Okay, so Good afternoon. Um, I started Mellow about three years ago to develop a functional food solution for elderly people with malnutrition-based sarcopenia dys dysphagia. We wanted to enhance, the, um, enhance these solutions by adding probiotics or bioactives, but were just simply unable to do this purely because we could not find a delivery system. And this is where we pivoted to what we're doing now. So we are Mellow, and we are trying to be the market leader in the delivery of stable, uh, sorry, unstable and sensitive actives by um, creating a microencapsulation technology platform. So we have a strong team based at the Bioinnovation Institute in Copenhagen. Um, we are... Um, well, my name is Lisa Tammy. I'm the founder and CEO, as you heard before. I have a commercial background, and I have experience in business development and project management. Musuma, who's sitting in the crowd, is our principal scientist, and his thing is microbiology, and we work very closely with Danish Technological Institute. They have the facilities and the equipment needed to do what we are trying to, um, to do. So, let's dive into the problem. Um, so we know that this wonderful world of microbiome science is generating a wealth of opportunity when it comes to the discovery of um, probiotics, and, and uh, that includes live biotherapeutics, that of course have the potential to confer health benefit and also target and modulate disease. But we also know that for many, they are extra or ultra sensitive and delivery is a problem. And for them to be effective, they need to be uh, package, they need to be delivered effectively, and they need to be delivered live and in adequate amounts. And this is where industry is still struggling. Um, so when you look at this sort of value system, packaging and delivery is still very much an unsolved problem. And there are four key uh, issues. One is stability within an application, so within a food, for example, or a liquid. The second is um, uh, maintaining the integrity of the, uh, of the active as it, as it travels down the gastrointestinal tract. The third is, of course, delivery and controlled relief, release. And then fourth is also actually heat. This is what we're told by industry, is that heat uh, tolerance is an issue for them. So these are, these are the four sort of main problems that we are, we are aware of in terms of speaking to industry and really understanding their pain points. This, of course, limits product development. Um, and we now are looking, um, well, we have come up with a solution, and we know that this solution has to be all-encompassing. It needs to take the four main pain points into, into account, and we need to develop something that actually solves all of them in one technology, because right now that is not possible. So our microencapsulation technology, um, we have developed the first true core particle, shell particle, using a lipid-based combination. And these lipids are very important because this gives us the characteristics we need to be able to create a, a, um, a, a, a robust moisture barrier and also um, increase stability. Uh, the second thing is that we've developed the first um, water-free process. So right now, the way microencapsulation, way microencapsulation is done is using generally a... Uh, um, processes that use water, and this limits shelf life when probiotics come into contact with water. So we've developed a process, we're still developing the process actually, that is water-free, but that importantly also enables us to develop this lipid-based true core particle at micro size. And that's also important because right now, the way microencapsulated particles are, are created, they are either too big, or they are matrix, or they are, but they're certainly not true core, and they are not, uh, and they are not free from water. 
Uh, we are also working very, very uh, closely with looking at the profile, the, sorry, the, deli the delivery and release profile, because that's obviously also extremely crucial to make sure that the, the uh, release is controlled and that it happens where it should happen so that the active can be effective. And then fourthly, of course, we are doing a lot of assays, we, develop, we are collecting a lot of data, and this is very important to be able to substantiate our claims. And, and this is what we keep getting told by industry, this is super great, just bring us, the, you know, bring us the data to substantiate, because we're super interested in what you're doing. Um, once we have this technology, um, once we have this technique, the idea is to then start uh, customizing it across different probiotics and, and also bioactives, so that we really do build a, a platform of different technologies that are suitable for, for sensitive and unstable uh, actives. So um, this is just to give you a, a taste of our um, proof of concept. So you'll see looking at figure A and figure B, um, looking at stability. So here are two true core particles at macro size. Um, both were created the same and both looked the same. But after a week, you'll see figure A, so the red color is indicative of, of probiotics. You'll see the probiotics are starting to migrate through and the, um, the, the macro particle is decreasing in size, which means that it's just not stable. With figure B is showing stability, there's no migration, and this is our true core particle um, that will hopefully stay stable like that for a, for a, a long length of time. Um, we're also working a lot with encapsulation and efficiency. We're still developing our process, but what we've got to date is a process that shows efficiency, microencapsulation efficiency of more than 50% compared to the conventional spray dryer. So we're running experiments across both, same process, same experiments, and we're seeing a much better encapsulation efficiency with the process that we are busy developing and still optimizing. And there's our Hannibal Lecter. Uh, in, in the lab, just uh, yeah, <laughs> playing with tubes and hoses. Um, so we know that this uh, sector is worth about 14 billion now and will grow to around 26 billion by 2030, so there is a lot of activity here. Um, but we can see that, that with increased acknowledgement that, of course, delivery is super important, we see more activity. Um, and, and, you know, as, as, we were, as we've discussed before amongst us, it's one thing putting X number in your mouth, but what is actually happening when it travels down to where it needs to go to be effective? And that is, that is very much part of what we're doing, is making sure that the efficiency is there. So we know that, that our competitors are using materials and processes that are not optimal. Um, and we know that if we can create something, well, this is our, this is our sort of holy grail, this is what we're attempting to do and anticipate that we will be able to develop a true core particle um, that is stable for 12 months plus, that can go into a liquid environment and, depending on the sensitivity of the active, lose only one log over those 12 months. And this is also what, uh, what industry is asking for to enable them to, um, you know, go into retail, for example, or, uh, yeah. To, to have this extended shelf life, and then, of course, effect is also important with the delivery. Um, so we're engaging with a lot of different companies. Uh, this is just a, this is an idea of who we're engaging with. Um, and in fact, just thinking back to the slide before, Probiotical, for example, an Italian company, they, they have created something lipid-based, but they've been very unsuccessful and they've now approached us. So we actually, well, we actually approached them thinking they were competitors and now we're talking about doing co-development together because they, they see microencapsulation as a way of differentiating themselves amongst their competitors. So we are, we are looking to work with them um, and actually all these companies are very actively engaging with us because they're super interested in our solution because there is just no solution in the market today, especially when it comes to super simple, uh, sorry, extra sensitive um, actives. So, and the other thing is that they all want to have the capability in-house. So we're looking at doing um, a technology licensing deal. So on that note, we're about to file for our first um, concept patent that will go in actually next week. And following that, we'll file for a patent for our process. And then we have another concept that we're working on. We're starting to do some discovery work on which we will look to, um, and we'll look to file that sometime in the new year. So we are very conscientious in protecting our... Um you need to oh, sorry. finish off. Oh, you sorry, have more sorry. than eight minutes. Oh, dear. So okay, please, sorry. Uh, 
Last slide, please. Last slide. So <laughs> basically, we're, we're looking to engage with anybody who can help our company grow, expand, and be successful. We're super early still, so there is so much opportunity. We've just uh, submitted our application for the next round of BioInnovation Institute. Hopefully, we get there, and thank you very much. Yeah. I have to end. Thank now. you very much. <laughs> Big round of applause. I don't know, perhaps there's one or two oh, questions sorry. from the jury. Yeah? Lars? Sure. C could, you, um, could you tell us how you want to exemplify your platform? What is the first application? What, what is the first um, uh, API or yes. drug composition you want to, to yes. use as a you know, demonstrator of your platform? Yes, sorry, and I wasn't very clear there. Um, so, so we're starting with probiotic microencapsulation for food and drink because purely from a regulatory point of view, it's a shorter route to market. So we're de developing, and from a regulation point of view, so long as it's not novel food, we can then go to CMOs, for example, and they can then use our technology and then together with the, with the ingredient provider, do the final regulatory part. Once we start working with um, more therapeutics, so live biotherapeutics, for example, and Baxera, we, you know, we're talking a lot with them. We know then that's a different, uh, different case when it comes to regulation. But first, yeah, food and drink. Okay, is there any other one? Yeah, okay, quick one. Yes? <laughs> I just wanted to ask you about how the process it looks like it's a prototype. Have you thought about how it's going to scale? Uh, can you comment on that? Sorry, how to scale the pro grow the process? Yes, so, so we're, still, we're still developing the actual process. Um, and once we've got that developed, we will then look at how we can, but we'll first have a lab scale. And yes, that is still a work in process. Um, but we are very conscious or conscientious about that. And I think the whole the whole idea is when we go into a CMO, because as I said, we'll license, it will be, it will be a, a part of the equipment that will, it's not gonna be an expensive piece of equipment that we know, but yes, we're still, we're still working on that. We do actually also have a few, thank you very much. <laughs> we do actually also have a couple of questions from the audience and I, I will just try and quickly, if you can make the answers short. I will try. Um, in this encapsulation, is this encapsulation also working for keeping the viability of anaerobic strains? Yes. So Good. Is the short answer. Yeah. Just then another, just as short. Lipids are absorbed in the small intestine. How do you ensure colonic delivery? Well, one, one step at a time. So right now we're developing this technique and we are focused on a delivery profile. And once we have that, we will then look to, you know, because we, we're fully aware that we need to develop different profiles, and we will then look to develop to deliver in wherever the, the other delivery area needs to be. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think we need to cut it there. Uh, there will be another break, so if uh, the audience, the ones asking the questions are here, they can do it in the breaks there. So please give Tommy a big round of applause. Thank you so much. The next presenter that I'm very pleased to welcome on stage is Søren Mølsvang, the CEO and founder of Microbiotics. That's correct. Yeah. You may stand wherever you are. The uh, control is there. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> <coughs> well, uh, thank you for the opportunity to visit and talk about our new company today. And... Um, Please consider this an appetizer. Be due to the time, there is, uh, I can't go into a lot of details, but it's a delight to be here to interact and network with all of you. So uh, Microbiotics, I co-founded earlier this year. It's based on two academic technologies. One we licensed from uh, the University of Copenhagen in Oslo. The other one is licensed from Berkeley and the University of New Mexico in the United States. These are both targeting the gut microbiome and some of the indications associated or diseases associated with dysfunction in the gut microbiome. We're here today because we're starting to look for capital. We're looking to raise 3 million euros and uh, be happy to talk to anybody about that. But uh, first, let me tell you a little bit more about our company. So the, the founding management team is, uh, is a group of seasoned entrepreneurs. We also have uh, two scientific co-founders. We have Benjamin, who's a professor and one of the inventors here in the audience today. And uh, Britt Koskella is a professor at UC Berkeley, and she's also on our uh, management team. In addition to that, we have um, competencies in pharmaceutical development, business development, capital formation, intellectual property development, and protection. 
So the, the, the problem we're trying to address, or the opportunity we want to you know, dive into, is uh, ulcerative colitis and IBS. And I, I have a suspicion that uh, many of you in the audience will know more about this than I do. Um, I just want to point out that there is, tr there is still tremendous unmet medical needs there. Um, ulcerative colitis, for instance, uh, you know, there, there are steroids, anti-inflammatories, immune modulating biologics you can use, and despite all of these options, uh, recent surveys showed that two-thirds of the patients asked about it still feel that the ulcerative colitis control them and not them managing their disease. All of that to say that there's a significant uh, unmet medical need. And similarly, in IBS, which is uh, another one of these uh, Western diet or lifestyle diseases, very prevalent in Western Europe and North America, we have probiotics, antibiotics, supplements, you name it, and still um, less than a third of patients feel that they are adequately managed <clears throat> for their symptoms. So I think here is another example of a great unmet medical need. And we are aware that there are other products in development, um, but I won't have time to get into that today. So how are we trying to address these problems or the opportunity created by the OMED medical needs? So the first technology is um, MCB2. This is a technology that we have in license from two Scandinavian universities. This um, consists of, uh, or is based on a, um, a pretty cool bacteria. It's Methylococcus capsulatus bath. I'll call it MCB from here on out. Um, it's a bacteria that can be fermented on methane only, methane as a sole carbon source. So it's been used historically as a protein source for farming fish and also uh, farm animals. So it's kind of a sustainable, very trendy uh, protein source. What was discovered a number of years ago is that um, in addition to serving as a protein source, it also prevents gastritis in salmon. Um, which, which is peculiar. I mean, why, why, should you, why, why should our food have gastritis to begin with? But it does, and it turns out this protein source actually can help prevent it. And researchers in Oslo discovered that um, the protein has similar effects in mouse models of colitis. Um, so that's really the premise for our technology. So we're now working with Ben at the University of Copenhagen to develop derivative products based on this bacteria that we want to develop for treatment of colitis and uh, NAFLD, perhaps um, dysbiosis as well. I won't have time to go into the data that supports the technology. I'll, I'll just share with you that it's peer-reviewed and published, uh, including a very recent Nature paper from Ben's lab. Uh, that shows that we can restore barrier function and, and um, promote Treg immune regulatory cell types when we treat this protein source, which is a sort of a new approach to managing ulcerative colitis. So we, we've, we're fairly excited at and, uh, about this, and we see we want to develop it as a pharmaceutical product. The the second product um, is licensed from the University of New Mexico and Berkeley. <clears throat> and it consists of bacteriophages. As some of you may know, bacteriophages, they exist um, along with their, um, their bacterial host. And if you look at the microbiome as a whole, you have all the bacteria there, uh, among many things, but you also have all their cognate matching bacteriophages. So this uh, GI lab at the University of New Mexico, they determined that if we do a fecal transplant from a lean mouse. Well, they didn't determine this, but you can do a fecal transplant from a lean mouse to an obese mouse, and you can cure some of the ailments that are associated with obesity. Then they went on to say, well, what if we, instead of trans doing the entire fecal, medical, the fecal transplant, what if we just transferred the um, VLP fraction, the bacteriophages? And it works exactly the same way. So this uh, patent application was submitted for this, and we have licensed it. But uh, the cool part about it is that you can get rid of the bacteria, so you, you eliminate some of the pathogenic risks that are associated with FMT, and you, you transfer the virus particles instead. So it, it could be a very neat way to improve on FMT as a procedure. Now, the lab at Berkeley is a phage lab and a plant biology lab, and they were curious, and they, they pursued this, and they said, well, what if we purified the VLPs from another source? And the first one they went to was sauerkraut, so fermented cabbage. And it turns out that if you purify the VLPs from fermented cabbage, 
we can similarly um, mitigate dysbiosis. And um, we want to develop this for treatment of cybosis, so small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And we have some pretty cool uh, proof of concept data. It's not published, so I'm not going to show it today, but <clears throat> I can tell you that we've submitted a patent application and uh, we see this as a really neat scalable opportunity, probably as a, potentially as a medical food. The first data I mentioned with the FMT, or the, the transfer of just um, VLPs from fecal matter, is published from the two um, uh, originating laboratories that are co-founders of our company. And I'd be happy to talk more about it afterwards, but I won't have time to go into the details here. I just want to tell you uh, about our thoughts on how we want to develop and commercialize this. So, um, like, like many pharma startups, we want to build it to sell it, right? We want to do what we're good at, which is the early stage development and de-risking. Then we want to hand it over to a larger partner and uh, hopefully make our shareholders happy in the process of doing that. So, for the MCB2 product, we think this should be developed as a pharmaceutical, typical preclinical INT enabling studies, phase one, phase two, a proof of concept, sometime during this, hopefully partner or out license the asset and provide return to our investors. We think with the use of proceeds we're looking to raise here, the proceeds we're looking to raise, we can uh, go from uh, concept to um, I, um, phase one ready IND packets submitted within uh, 26 months. For the VLP product, given that it'll be based on a food, we think this could be a functional food or a medical food, a supplement, um, and there we could move a lot faster because of the regulatory path forward. We think within a couple of years, we could, move, we could go from the, the prototype we're currently developing with um, sauerkraut manufacturers and take this to human proof of concept in healthy um, volunteer, or, volunteers with GI issues. So basically, we're looking to raise uh, 3 million euros to reach a number of preclinical tilting goal and um, regulatory milestones. And with that, I will stop. Thank you, Matt. Let's hear, there might be some questions from the jury. That's the, my first eight minute presentation. <laughs> Sometimes you are. Yes, uh, I'm Michigan. curious about the Lysate for the MCB product. Um, you start with material and then you lyse, you get final material, but how do you get uh, control for batch to batch variation? Because that process is not very well controlled as far as I'm aware. Benjamin, would you like to try or yeah. shall I try? Yeah. No, I yeah. Do we have a microphone perhaps? Of course. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So um, we have produced this and we have found commercial producers of this bacterial lysate. And we have tested it in a more than 10 different models by now. And have, we have very reproducible results in terms of um, normalizing uh, dysbiotic gut microbiota and in terms of IT rig, uh, so regulatory T cell induction in the gastrointestinal tract. And we are now trying to chase down the effect of molecules. The um, US manufacturer recently submitted a grass application for using it as a feed for animals and the process controls you need for that are pretty stringent. But it is a very tricky bug to cultivate. Okay. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, Denise? Yeah, I probably just want to um, pick up on the VLP. So yeah. um, can you say anything about it? I mean, obviously I know it's food derived um, and you would argue that you could put it through a medical food route, but do you know anything about the activity of it or anything like that that makes you feel that this one is going to be considered a food, food derived product that won't be regulated as a drug? I base that mainly on the fact it would start with sauerkraut, which itself is a food. Mm -hmm. But I will also say I don't have an intelligent answer. So we're working with a, with a <laughs> regulatory group to try to map out the answers we need to address your question. And, and I think we could go either way with it. We're, we're not medical foods people, but we are fascinated by the idea of moving fast at a lower cost than a pharmaceutical. And if we can, we try it. Otherwise, we'll do it as a pharmaceutical. Sorry, thank you. Sorry. Okay. I have one question from the audience here. Okay. Um, does the phages also have effect on bacterial spores? I do not know the answer to that, not being a phage biologist. Okay, good. Okay, straight. Give some a big hand of applause. <laughs> so the next presenter we have on stage before we have a short break is Johan Braun Hartmann from Unseen Bio.
and you have eight minutes. You can follow the words. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> Hello, I'm Johan Hartmann, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Unseen Bio. In 2018, my friend and I, we set out on a vision to improve the health of individuals. And we wanted to do so by testing the microbiome, the gut microbiome, as we saw a huge potential in the developing science and very little offered to the end consumer. And our mission, our goal is to creating the number one digital platform for gut health. So, why are we doing this? I think all the presentations today have emphasized the importance of the gut microbiome. So, the problem within the gut microbiome currently that we are targeting is the biodiversity crisis that's actually ongoing, similar to the biodiversity crisis that is going on around us. So we have an internal diversity crisis where the gut microbiome is on demise. 20% of Western guts actually have too few microbes, and we are targeting that. The gut microbiome is modulated by a lot of different things, all the way from genetics and where you live to the diet and the supplement you eat. And as we have a target of creating something that the user can use now, the client can use now. Our focus is on the diet because we believe that this is the most elegant way to uh, approach a preventive uh, gut microbiome system. So what is our solution? It is a microbiome test direct for the consumer. The customer journey is that you buy our test online or through a distributor. Five days prior to the test, you will uh, register your diet, then you take the test, send it back to us, we get it shotgun sequenced in our partner lab, we analyze and interpret the data and serve the results to our clients on their own profile on My Unseen Bio, our microbiome universe. So, you'll get an overview of the gut microbiome, that how it looks, you get levels of beneficial, non-beneficial bacteria. You'll get a score of the biodiversity of your gut based on the alpha diversity compared with the reference group. You also get levels of selected probiotics that we measure, and you will get a score on the diet that you registered. And you can see my diet here was not optimal, so I have way to improve. You'll get on that tangible personal advice based on that diet registration on how to improve. So our probiotics selector that I first mentioned, how does that work? As we do a DNA sequencing of the gut, we can see what, mic what uh, probiotic strains are present, and we co collate that, correlate that with products and what is present in each client's gut. And th thus, we give them a tool, because a lot of our cli clients is interested in probiotics, how to do a more informed selection. So what is our business model? We sell primarily direct to consumers. We are sequencing clients' uh, microbiomes as we speak. Um, we, do have, we have online sales on our own website, and we have uh, distributors in online pharmacies, metas, so on and so forth. We also have B2B2C approach with health insurances as, and private healthcare providers, and our fast analysis system and, and our uh, easy communicative approach has also resonated with uh, B2B industry clients where we have, uh, have, a, have a business leg there as well. So our market, our users primarily segment into two. The gainers, those are the ones who want to improve. They go to fitness centers, they want to do something proactive uh, in order to improve their health. Then we have the painers that are representative of some of the ones that you mentioned. Primary with GI problems, IBS, IBD. They call me every day and hear what can I do to help them. We are not a medical device, we have not a me medical purpose, but I can. 
show them their microbiome, and they can use it for together with their doctors if they want. We want to do this as a mainstream product because we see a huge benefit and huge potential for both uh, the individual and the society as a whole monitoring this. We, are, we have a built solution, scalable platform we are selling every day, and we see this market as immature and the right place to be, and we see an opportunity to, to, for Unseen Bio to be the European market leader in this. Our team, besides me, we are a co-founder team of five. We have within systems biology, we have software, bioinformatician, my colleague Jens, who is with me today. We have sales and also a dietitian who is um, handling client feedback and also our diet recommendation system. And then we have our faceless board that helps us steer uh, the path that we are going on. We are a complete team and well equipped for the, challenge, for the challenges that lies ahead. And what are those? We have our own internal development path. We are looking very much into fungi. Our product is, is modularized, so we add modules and update. We are looking into metadata and reference group expansion. We are also lo looking into detailed correlations between foods and the microbes. And we are also uh, working a lot with the, the function of the microbes and not only the presence. And of course, utilizing the data um, that we are gathering. We have um, exploratory pathways that we are also looking at because um, this is a very broad field. And we are looking in both medical, within medical, uh, probiotics, and um, using our system as a service. So, what is the plan? We have just recently closed a funding round of 6 million Danish kroners with a target of taking us from being the leading uh, direct-to-consumer brand in Denmark to Northern Europe. We have uh, milestones along the way, moving into Germany, selling 3,000 kits and having three significant uh, industry partnerships. We have a very strong focus on sales, both to B2C but also in the B2B area. And our uh, goal is to close a funding round, taking us to be the leading one in Europe, as I mentioned before. A comment on our IP is that uh, our system is developed, it's software, but the data, we have proprietary rights uh, as that expands. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Johan. And perhaps there's one or two questions from the jury. Yep. Uh, yep. Uh, do you have any competitors today where you simply just can submit a sample and then have it uh, have it analyzed? Sorry, I didn't get... Do you have any competitors today where in your, in Europe just can submit your sample and have it, uh, have it analyzed and have a report back? We do have uh, competitors in uh, Europe. The, the competitor landscape is dominated in Euro and in US by very large players, and we, there's mostly small uh, to medium uh, research-founded companies in Europe, and they are all, we are all battling to, to win that market. And it is possible to, to do that, to do a similar service uh, with a competitor in, in other Europe's uh, competitors, yes. Okay, otherwise we have, there are quite a lot of questions from the audience, but I think we only have time to take one or two. Uh, one of them, how do you define beneficial versus detrimental microbes? Normally this would be context and or diet dependent. Our beneficial list uh, we have created so, together with some of our research advisors, simply, you know, uh, from, from our own research together with them uh, as knowledge. Um, but it's true that, and, and the same way with our non-beneficial or opportunist bacteria, but it's true that 
the, the, the gut microbiome is very individual. Mm. And what, is, what can be detrimental, if it's not pathogenic for some, can actually be a, a very natural state for others. Mm. So that, that is a valid point, and that is why compare, to compare yourselves to reference groups and to yourself over time is very important. Mm -hmm. And just another one, we have a quick one. Can you reveal your shotgun sequencing partner? And where are your own potential GDPR issues? Um, I can say that our uh, shotgun partner is in Germany. Okay. And that's, more, that's what I can disclose here. Okay. And then I can say that the GDPR uh, problems are ever present and all over. Yeah. And that is why we are ha having a strong focus on that from day one. Okay. Good. We won't have time to take there are many more. And again, if the questions come from your audience here in the room, there will be time in the break to go out and ask Johan directly or Jens, his colleague. Otherwise, thank you very much, Johan. Thank Please you. also give Hannah a applause. Thank you, Camilla. Thank you to our three pitching companies. Um, we have heard from six pitching companies so far. There are three left but we want to make sure that your brain is refreshed so there is a short leg stretch and chance for more coffee and tea. We'd we'll like you back here in the room at uh, 350, but make sure you start thinking about your top three choices and start thinking about which three you want to put in the poll. So go for your break and I'll see you back here in about 15 minutes. Thank you.
Now we are entering the final session of the year three, uh, I wouldn't say old companies, but not so young companies. Uh, so let's see how, how the, the people will look. And the last three presentations between ourselves and the champagne afterwards. So uh, please keep your uh, senses up and make sure that you choose your favorite also in this group. Um, we as a, a project, we're also consisting of investment promotion agencies like myself coming from Invest in Skåne and Camilla coming from Copenhagen Capacity. So really two sister organizations trying to build and support the business ecosystems in various industries. But today we're focusing on the life science. And one of the results out of this project has of course been to, to uh, try to make companies established in our ecosystems and therefore it's a pleasure actually to be able to welcome one of the results of this project today here. So that is why what we are trying to do when companies come here and establish we also try to introduce them into the ecosystem so they really get a strong foothold here in the, in the region to employ people, to develop the business and to really contribute to the ecosystem. So by that, I would like to introduce Irma Öskan, the CEO and founder of Ambiosis. Please welcome Irma. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, you see my screen, right? Okay. Yeah, we say trust your gut because actually the number of people who are suffering due to chronic disease are increasing and you know, it, I'm not talking about the millions, billions of people are suffering and somebody should say, you know, we should stop it, right? And there's a new hope, you know, the gut microbiome today we are talking about, it's, it's not just a product, it's not just a technology, it's a hope, I guess. And uh, we are also uh, bringing a new hope to the table and we say, okay, we can prevent, we can diagnose, we can treat these diseases. And, uh, yeah, sorry, yeah. And the Embios is not only a product or a pharma company or you know, any kind of the you know, biotechnology company. Actually, we do have a vision. We have a vision and behind the mission. We are trying to understand the language of these bacteria. You know, billions of years ago, and okay, they, 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 they came up to this space and we want to understand their language, okay, how they're speaking. Okay, uh, what are they eating? How, how they are in uh, you know, relation to us, the universe? So that, that, that's our vision actually. And we have developed an artificial intelligence platform. And uh, this, this software, first of all, we use in different space. I will explain from preventive diagnostics and the therapeutics. But this is the vision. And as, as a first step, as a first step, we create an algorithm, the optimization algorithm. It's the optimum optimal diet strategy to change the flora, to you know, the increase the, you know, the status of the flora in a healthier way. So the uh, Embryo's optimal strategy today is consists of a uh, personal nutrition plan, it's a diet strategy, plus personal prebiotics and personalized probiotics. And uh, yeah, it, it is okay, you know, diet and the supplement and the microbiome, the data, AI, all these good words, but what's next? Uh, you know, is there an outcome? That, that's actually what we had tried to uh, show, okay? We have done it, but it works, and we have conducted clinical trials and tested 4,000 people. And uh, the first clinical trials for, for was the irritable bowel syndrome, around 10% of the world population. And the second one is the uh, chronic constipation. By the way, uh, for the first one, IBS, we got the minor revision uh, comments from gut microbes, and and I, 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 I was expecting it will be published when I came here, but I guess it, it will take a few days. Probably next week or in the 10 days we expect to publish. So, I, as I know in the market, actually this comprehensive diet strategy with the AI-driven microbiome diet strategies effect on the gastrointestinal disease, it will be a good step for all of us. And in addition to all these bubble habits, and we also observe these 4,000 people, the energy level, their sleep disorders, and their weight loss. Yeah, now we come up to the you know, business strategy. The first product today, the comprehensive diet strategy. Our go-to-market strategy in the U.S. and out of U.S., we have two strategies, by the way. In the U.S., we are targeting IBS patients, around 30 million IBS patients, and their you know, annual spending is $6,000. And uh, yeah, we, 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 are, we, are, we are going to 
sorry, we are going to uh, work with healthcare providers and they will use our products as an alternative treatment tool to reach out these patients. And we are selling our $175 this treatment tool with including test kits, supplements, and application. There are 5,000 different meals, recipients, and the shopping list and everything there. And plus, we are also uh, educating them and supporting them to sell after the treatment protocol as a 52 weeks program, as a subscription base, and we are selling to the practitioners $400. This is the model in the US. We start with the functional medicine practitioners, and we will shift to the gastroenter, uh, other, other practitioners in the future. We are expecting for the reimbursement. Uh, now we have finalized our billing strategy and we will test it. And after this publication, it will also uh, push us and support us. That's what we believe. And the second model, which is also quite unique in the market, we are uh, going, you know, we, we have started, by the way, we are discussing with, for example, different companies like Roundox, Omega, and different types of you know, laboratories so far. And the supplement companies also are uh, candidates. Um, you know, we are licensing our software to the wellness industry. Uh, we would like to scale this business, uh, not only in Europe, Middle East, and Asia too. And we care about actually, you know, if if we if we uh, deliver our software, our, our technology, the you know the healthcare providers, distributors, companies, it will reach these patients. That's our vision here, and uh, that's how, what we are doing. And uh, how how the system works? Uh, the customer, the, our partners, uh, they you know they give these uh, test kits. Their test kit is a white label model, by the way. They can give their test kits to these, their customers, and they send these two samples to any laboratories. By the way, any laboratories means, yeah, we have agreements, for example, Eurofins. We are working with Eurofins in the States, different laboratories, and for the Middle East, different laboratories. But any laboratories which has NGS is possible, and they just send these two samples, and they just upload the raw data. That is what we need. And in the end, we provide their diet strategy, their recipients, and their precision supplements formulas. By the way, we share our formulas, and we just sell information. That's what we do. And our software click fee is just $30 per sample. And if it's the annual license fee, $100,000. If there's an exclusive in our sales right, it depends on the market. Yeah, and what we do, actually, yeah, as I said, we care about the data because we, we don't want to stop here. Yeah, we just started with the diet. And it's a preventive, but also some kind of a treatment approach. However, we would like to discover more biomarkers to understand better to understand the language better. So we collect this data, but you know how we do, for example, the data protection, right? It is our you know, you know, partner's patient's data. So we get the anonymous data, we are just training our AI, we just mine it, that is all. We don't keep it, you know, we are not the owner of this data. So we just train our AI and develop new biomarkers, that's what we do. And, um, you know, so far we have already developed some uh, the, the different products. First of all, the early diagnostic for the gastrointestinal diseases, colorectal cancer, IBD and IBS, just one panel, we can analyze around 90% accuracy of these you know, diseases with, with, this, with this sample. And now we have started clinical validation. And then uh, the next is the next, next generation probiotics. We have already uh, discovered two novel biomarkers. One of them will be used for the IBD treatment, this gene island is very specific and we have applied for the patent. The second, it can be used for the simple sugar to butyrate, which we believe that it will be very interesting and it will be disruptive for the food industry. So, uh, so far we have you know, already spent one and a half million dollars. I explain how we have done it with the <laughs> limited finance. And, but you know, we would have a positive cash strategy. Especially, you know, since we are licensing our software, we generate cash, and we are not investing in the awareness, we are not investing in the B2C uh, marketing strategy. That's why we do have a positive cash strategy. Uh, that is why the amount of money to support our business model, especially for the, we just entered to the U.S. market, is uh, like a bridge finance for 12 months to support our cash, uh, post, uh, cash positive strategy. It's around one and a half million dollars so far. We got the 700 uh, as a term sheet uh, last week, and we are just uh, trying to close it. So uh, we have a financial model, all the assumptions, all the rational, and we see the attractions already. So, you know, actually the cloud-based model will allow us the data uh, richness, and the, we use the different products. Uh, that's the team. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh. So thank you. I, I actually almost lost the time because I got really absorbed by your by your uh, thinking here and uh, and uh, this mo this model that you're applying your business model here. I mean, is it really 
commercialized in in a sense. I really didn't get that fully. I mean, how yeah, yeah. Look, uh, cloud-based model, right? Um, we al already started by the we tested. We already sold some companies already. It's the white label. For example, you know the laboratory companies, hospitals. They we we, we just license our software. So what they do is they they do their own operations. Uh, they send the, stool, uh, the sample, you know, this um, kit to their you know own patients. Uh, they send the samples to the you know, laboratories. They just upload the data. So we give them formulas, prebiotic formulas, probiotic formulas, all the you know uh, food recommendations reports to their panel. So mm. they use this strategy on the unit panels and in their markets. Fantastic. Yeah. So uh, Klaus. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Very inspiring. Um, I just have to. Sorry, for, I'm, I'm I'm really colored by the regulatory pathways that all our companies have to go through, right? So when you're saying that you have 85% improvement in bowel habits, and also increase in energy level, da 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 da, I just think you have to be very mindful when you are going commercial because these are claims in clinical terms that needs to be supported. You said that you had conducted two studies, all including 7,000 patients. Um, so can you say a little about, you know, did, were there control groups um, and okay. were they conducted okay. under supervision by email or FDA? Was it formal protocols or can you please, yeah, please sure. qualify a little? Sure, you know, the, during this, uh, let me explain how these uh, clinical trials were. Uh, it was a six weeks program. You know, the first day we got all the stool samples and the, the uh, bacteria DNA analysis, this microbiome profiles. Then, according to this, we run our AI and all the food strategy, the diet strategy, and their supplements. Then six weeks, we followed them. The dietitians followed their diet protocol. Then whatever they eat. Then the, after the six weeks, you know, the, you know. By the way, all these, you know, um, how can I say, the objective observations with the doctors and all the ethical goals. You know, by the way, it's gonna be published. That's why uh, <laughs> all these uh, ethical processes and all the details were already questioned. And then we analyzed again. By the way, the good thing is, it's not only the clinical output. For example, there are some companies, they also uh, claim about the effect, for example, cognitive behavior therapy, right? There are some companies, and they also say, okay, uh, if they follow this psychological treatment some, uh, around the four weeks or whatever, they can also uh, help these people. However, our protocol is different because we observe the difference of these bacteria. Okay, especially uh, analyze some specific bacteria concurred the ecosystem, okay, like their dictatorship, okay, dictatorship. And what we had done after six weeks is, you know, just, you know, they kill uh, most of them who, who got this di dictatorship and, you know, decrease the number. And after decrease their number and around uh, those bacteria, okay, it also affected on the relief you know, of these symptoms. It is not just the clinical outcome of people, okay, I feel better. It is also, you know, supporting by the, you know, the real mathematical data. That's actually, I guess, the, and, and, you know, that's not only a chance or psychological effect. Of course, it affects the psychology, it's a gut brain access, but we are not playing in the psychology. Thank you, Amer uh, Michel. Yeah, I have a short question. I understand you're going to conduct your clinical trials in Turkey. Um, but you're rolling out your product in the U.S. We know through various reasons uh, that there's a lot of geographic differences in makeup of the microbiome, and that's one of your outcome parameters. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to correct the Turkish outcome to the U.S. market? Yeah, first of all, uh, our data bank around 45,000 profile, 16,000 from the you know U.S., and 11,000 from the Turkey, and the remaining from Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. First of all, the data which the AI is running is the global data. The second, we have tested already the same patients group with some partner companies already. They wanted to see the, you know, the results of already and in the States too. So, and uh, yeah, you are right. The profiles are different. And that's actually what the embryos is, I guess, the main difference between the competitors. We are not assigning just a healthy profile there. Uh, you know, the, the system, the agents, you know, is finding the right possible uh, healthier profile in the data bank close to that profile. So because, let's say, there is a healthy profile in Turkey, there is a healthy profile in the state, there is a healthy profile in Australia, whatever. But the thing is here, you know, it's affecting the last of environmental effect, right? We need to find the possible closest one because it, you can assume it's a, like a coordinates in the space. 
and we are just changing number of these bacterial ratios in the space coordinates. So the optimization is finding the right way. That's actually the systematic and the details I can share with how we done it. But the overall the embryo's vision is not here, okay? We just started. I'm talking about the universe here, okay? We just started, like the first planet here in the Earth, right? There are lots of planets to discover, but I don't say, okay, we, we have done already. We, I just say, we just started. I guess we are going in, in a right way. And uh, as I said, our discoveries, these biomarkers, especially these gene islands, they are really interesting, and we, would ju we just want to move forward. That's thank you, Amir. I think universe is a great limit for any startup company. Eh? <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. So, uh, as I said, I mean, our region is really comprised of a lot of really good researchers, especially female researchers and female entrepreneurs. So, now I'm actually giving you two to present on stage. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, the CEO of uh, Gidea Biotech, Annette Seafolm, and uh, uh, Helena Strevens, who is a senior consultant in gynecology at Skåne University Hospital and also chairman of the board. I no, medical director. Medical director, sorry. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Quite all right. sorry, sorry, sorry. Board member. Board member. Board member. Most welcome. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you so much for inviting us here to speak today. My name is Annette Savon, and I'm the CEO of Gidea Biotech. And I'm Helena Stravens, Medical Director. <laughs> and we're very proud to present Gidea Biotech's pr pr best-in-class treatment and prevention of bacterial vaginosis, which is completely free of antimicrobials, improves the healthy vaginal flora, and uh, prevents uh, recurrence thereby, unlike any other products on the market. Gidea is a privately held spin-out from Lund University six years ago, uh, founded by three chemists, Ulf, Sophie and uh, Olof, and Helena, senior physician in gynaecology. We're based in Lund and have a strong team in uh, operations in uh, clinical and product management and uh, quality and regulations, and we have one of our team members, Birgis, here as well. We're also very proud of our uh, latest addition, a PhD student in vaginal microbiome bioinformatics in collaboration with Karolinska. Uh, bacterial vaginosis is uh, associated with a lot of um, problems, uh, complications. Uh, not only the patients have uh, an increased vaginal discharge of fish odor, uh, which severely impacts the daily life of the patients. It can also lead to severe infections in association with uh, surgical procedures or uh, associated with pregnancy and has a substantially increased prevalence of uh, preterm birth with devastating consequences. Bacterial vaginosis is currently treated with antibiotics uh, with a fairly high cure rate in the short term, but uh, one third of the patients have a recurrence of the infection already at one month, and it's also associated with a high incidence of vulvovaginal candidiasis infections to be treated with antibiotics. Uh, repeated courses of antibiotics and um, fungals lead to an increasing re uh, resistance in the society, rapidly becoming one of the largest global threats to, uh, to global health. So, what's the solution? So, uh, the solution, well, in Gidea we are developing a local treatment, FIF. It's a vaginal ta tablet. Uh, which in two uh, phase two trials has been shown uh, with one, one tablet daily for six days uh, to have a cure rate in line with antibiotic treatments. Yet it's shown to be safe, well tolerated and totally free from these antibiotics that drive uh, resistance. Also, it prevents recurrence by promoting a healthy vaginal microbiome. Now, how can this be possible? Well, our idea is three modes of action rolled into one promoter of uh, a healthy vaginal microbiome. Uh, we maintain, with our treatment, a low pH. Uh, we remove the biofilm that protects the pathogenic bacteria and in both in vitro and in clinical studies, 
uh, the treatment has been shown to promote growth of Lactobacillus crispatus, which is a beneficial uh, bacteria, whereas it inhibits the growth of Gadnerella, uh, with, which is a pathogenic bacterium that also builds up the biofilm. So we definitely want to be rid of that. Also, because of, we have this healthy vaginal microbiome from the treatment, we have a very low incidence of secondary candida infections. We've actually shown the treatment, uh, the, or the treatment has been shown to be promising also in candida infections. So we are planning a phase two trial even there. So um, here are the graphs showing what I just said that PFIF in vitro promotes the growth of Lactobacillus crispatus. You can see the red line there on the left graph. Now, crispatus is the, one of the most beneficial bacteria of the vaginal microbiome and is an indicator in pregnancy of a healthy term normal birth. Uh, the right graph, you can see the inhibition in vitro of Gadnerella, which is a pathogenic bacteria associated with bacterial vaginosis. Next one. Uh, we've seen this effect also in the clinical tri uh, trials because the vaginal micro microbiome, 7 to 14 days after treatment, show an increased relative abundance of Crispatus, whereas the increase of other bacteria, for instance, the less beneficial Lactobacillus enus, is uh, increased but to a lesser extent. If we follow these patients 35 days after the treatment and the follow-up, we can see that these bacteria are reduced again in the Candida study, whereas interestingly, it seems that they continue to increase in the vaginosis study. Next one. Uh, so by this mode of action, we've seen that uh, in two clinical studies, we have a clinical cure rate in line with antibiotic treatments. And pleasingly for the patients, the most disturbing and pronounced symptom, the fishy smell, which often prompts the uh, the need for treatment, is reduced in 90% of patients and with rapid onset already on the first day. Gadea has a strong patent protection with four patent families with a wide global protection and a patent lifetime until the early 2040s. Uh, there is a strong market potential also for innovative treatments in the women's health space with a global market close to one and a half billion euros uh, for the current products. Uh, and importantly, patients with bacterial vaginosis are concerned and worry about the recurrence risk all the time, a problem that our product addresses, which would mean an expansion of the market. Since Gidea was founded in 2015, we have verified the safety and effectiveness of the treatment through preclinical work, a bacterial vaginosis clinical proof of concept study in 24 patients, a vulvovaginal candidiasis pilot uh, trial, and lately a phase 2b bacterial vaginosis trial, including 252 patients, where also focus was on recurrence prevention. The last study was funded by a 3 million euro Horizon grant. Up upcomingly, we are looking forward to initiate a phase, a phase two vulvovaginal candidiasis trial shortly, expecting a CMR approval for Europe in the beginning of next year, and looking for collaborations for marketing and sales in Europe, as well as for the upcoming phase three trials for US approval as a medicinal RX product. We are also looking forward to establishing collaborations on preterm birth studies based on the interesting finding that our product promotes the beneficial Lactobacillus crispatus, uh, which is seen to be crucial for a term delivery in pregnancy. 
like to end with a quote from one of, the, uh, one of our key opinion leaders, who was principal investigator for our latest study, who concludes that we have treatments uh, available on the market, um, antibiotics, which work fairly well in the short term, but there are high recurrence rates associated with them, leading to a consequence that the patients are repeatedly uh, dosed with antibiotics, contributing to a resistance issue in the world. A non-antibiotic treatment that also could prevent recurrence would therefore be a major step forward. Thank you all for listening to the Gidea story. Please contact me or Helena if you share a goal in making a contribution to global women's health. Thank you, Annette and Helena. So I think you one would like to start with the first question. Yeah, maybe I was really too slow because you were speaking so fast. So uh, <laughs> what is the actual product? It is a vaginal tablet, slowly releasing. Yeah. It's tab taken uh, once uh, daily for six days. It's two small molecules, uh, and they are approved as um, um, food, gen additives. food additives, generally recognized as safe. Uh, but they haven't been used in medical, uh, medicinal products before. Okay, so, okay, so that, uh, I was asking so, for the content of the tablet. Yeah, small molecules. So it doesn't contain any live bacteria. But okay. it's working by removing the biofilm, lowering the pH, and uh, increasing the, um, promoting the growth of beneficial bacteria. Klaus? Um, thank you very much. Very nice presentation, I have to say. <clears throat> um, what is your opinion about, you can, you can actually you can buy over-the-counter, uh, it's called, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can dry, you, you can buy, suppositories or whatever they call it uh, for, for engraftment or for insertion into the vagina that contains a mix of lactobacillus and different strains and forms and so forth. W are you working, are, are, do, are, do you see effects to the same level or are you going beyond them or what is your, because some of the claims you're making will be the same for those as well, right? Um, recurrence rates and so forth. Have you tested against and how do you expect to be benchmarked against them? The over-the-counter products have, have not shown any clinical effect, and that is what we are aiming with, to have strong clinical benefit shown, which also convinces the key opinion leaders in the field. So our aim in Europe is to both target key opinion leaders and gynecologists with the marketing, as well as patients, and thereby having dual. But we are claiming, uh, having, uh, aiming to have a strong clinical claim and thereby uh, differentiate ourselves from uh, current products which do not have any claims at all because they haven't published any studies. Any further questions from the uh, from Michelle? Yes, yeah, so if I looked at the graphs, it looked like your five percent tablet was less well performing than the two and a half percent. So, are you going to do any titration studies in uh, in vivo, or can you explain it at least? <laughs> No, we can't really we, we can't we can't really explain that. We don't know why it, it seems that um, uh, a certain certain degree. Uh, it could be that uh, we need a certain degree of uh, pH, and that that is what is driving the different uh, the differences. Mm. Okay, thank you so much, thank Annette. You. And, you know, uh, there's questions also coming in here, but I think uh, for you guys putting the questions. Make sure to contact Annette and Helena after here in the break afterwards. Thank you so much. Uh, so now actually coming to maybe a quite well-known name, Biogaia, in the microbiome field um, and the probiotics. This is actually a company that has been nurtured and, and developed within, let's say, the, the arms of Biogaia, but are standing very strong by itself, and now it's ready for the world to find out more about this. So please welcome uh, Mr. Nigel Titford. Thank you. Okay, um, thanks. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the opportunity to talk today. Um, yeah, so we're part of a, a quite well-known company. I plan today to, um, can we go backwards? There we go. Uh, so I plan today, I'll tell you about Biogaia Pharma, um, uh, our, our kind of uh, development um, pathway and our main programs, and then about our partnering strategy as well. Um, so as you mentioned, we're, we're part of a, uh, a we're, we sit under the umbrella of Biogaia, 
Um, we were founded actually in 2017, so a relatively new company. Um, but we sit within a, a company who's been around for quite a long time. So BioGuy is a, uh, really a, a 30 year, over 30-year-old research and development company from the probiotic space. Um, and today is really a, a branded dietary supplement company um, working in over 100 countries around the world. So we sit as a subsidiary there. We were set up as a, really as a channel for, um, for developing LBP opportunities that were coming out of BioGuy's research network. Um, and the goal with those really was to, to or our strategy is, is to really take those through early phase clinical development through the start of CMC process and then, and then to look to partner quite early on in the process. Um, we're a very small company. We're two, the whole company is actually here today. So um, uh, <laughs> Petra, my colleague, is over there. So I, I come with 20, almost 25 years of experience working with probiotics and in the microbiome space. And Petra has a background in immunology and I'm really working with operation, development operations with, with startup companies. So, and together we really manage an, a network. We have a very good board of, a board of advisors, who, who, including another company who's in phase three for LBP development. Um, and we have a network of companies uh, and institutions that really help us to uh, get through this development process. Um, okay, so this is really our, our development story, if you like. Um, so it really starts off actually with clinical research um, or, or preclinical, usually, usually clinical research. So there may be that we have studies done on probiotics, which, which show a signal that, that maybe these bacteria can have an impact on inflammation or another um, condition. And then we actually go backwards through, so taking a translational approach, we go back and try and understand the mechanisms behind these effects that we've seen in the clinic. Um, and then Biogai Pharma tends to come in around the strain selection, preclinical pre bridging point of the project, and we take the project then into CMC and clinical development. Um, we, we spend actually the first three years going through projects, trying to uh, assess whether they were worthwhile taking into, um, taking into clinical projects. So, um, and we've landed really with two, two now in the clinic. And I'll just tell you a little bit about, about those. So we have a developed TPP for this project. This is the first. So we have a single strain uh, lactobacillus candidate for UC. Uh, and um, really with the, the uh, potential for inducing and prolonging remission by restoring intestinal homeostasis, so through an impact on inflammation. Uh, we see a need for a, an oral delivery second-line product, so after 5-ASA, um, that, that has a good efficacy pro profile, but also a, a good safety profile. And we're targeting the roughly 2 million mild to moderately active UC patients in, in the US and Europe. We have a, a developing IP portfolio behind the product as well. Uh, so to go into a little bit more detail on this, we have, uh, so, so based on a, a number of clinical studies showing a possible impact on inflammation and inflammatory conditions, we then went back uh, and through a collaboration with Baylor uh, College of Medicine in Texas, we then, um, we identified one possible mechanism uh, whereby these bacteria are able to impact inflammation. And that is then, uh, so that is really a combination of uh, having a bacteria that produces histamine, but also a, a DAG, DAGK, um, which is able to block uh, histamine uptake in one receptor while the hist histamine is increased in the, in the H2 receptor. And that combination is able to suppress TNF-alpha production in the gastrointestinal tract and having a local effect, uh, which we think... Um, gives it strong potential within UC. We then, uh, oh, went a bit too fast there. So we, uh, so Biogai Pharma then came in, we, we looked at a bank of strains and we've, we've looked at the mechanism, we've tried to then select a strain based on the mechanism uh, to have an improved effect um, in, this, in this area. And then we've taken that through uh, a typical model of, um, for, for UC, which is the DSS model. Uh, shown that we have a, an impact on the disease activity index and a whole range of uh, outcomes on that, on that model, um, and then prepared really for, for the clinical study. And I'll come back to that in a minute. Our second program is, is uh, again with a single strain, lactobacillus, um, this time for chronic opioid-induced constipation. 
So we had a number of clinical studies showing that it might be a benefit for motility conditions. Um, and we went back and, uh, anyway, I'll get to the mechanism in a second. So we see a need here for, a, for an oral therapy which has at least as good efficacy as the, the existing uh, Pamora treatment uh, and with a, with a more favorable side effect profile. And we're targeting roughly two, two and a half um, US non-cancer pain patients and um, that are laxative refractory and roughly one million in Europe. We also have developing IP in that area. Um, so this was then a collaboration with uh, McMaster in Canada, uh, where they went through a series of in, uh, ex vivo, in, vitro, um, in vivo models to show that um, selected bacteria could have an improved impact on, on motility. Um, and we actually saw, so this is a gut brain axis um, impact. Uh, and what we actually see in the ex vivo models is that we have a, a more regular contraction in the intestinal tract. So, so there's an improvement in frequency, velocity, and pressure in the, in the intestinal tract. And they actually took it through a strain, so they, a strain selection process and found a strain that, that ha was very good at performing this mechanism um, and put it through a, then an OIC mouse model where they use loperamide to induce a, um, a, a flattening of, the, of this frequency. Okay, so one minute left. So, so today we're, we're actually in phase, so for the UC program, we're in phase one. We're doing a, a small study in Sweden uh, with uh, about 50 patients. So it's a, it's a safety study in, in patients, uh, but we have a, a number of exploratory outcomes we're looking at as well. So if we can see a signal there. Um, and then the, the OIC program is a phase two study with over 100 patients in uh, France. Um, there are a number of other projects that we could look at as well, but this is what we can deal with at the moment. Um, and really, as I said at the beginning, our partnering strategy, we, we have finance for the ongoing studies, but we, we will be looking to partner. We're, we're hoping to get these studies completed by the end of uh, next year, and then to, to start looking for, so we, we'll start looking for partners then, either out licensing the projects or, or taking in finances to carry them on. Okay? Thank you for listening. Thank you, Nigel. Uh, do we uh, seem yeah. that you one is gearing up there with the microphone already? So please go ahead, Johan. Yeah, you have to be quick in this panel. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, you, um, first of all, interesting approach, going kind of backwards uh, to find the mechanism of action. Looking at the, uh, the UC model, where you have the DSS model, which is a classical model. Have you done any head-to-head -to, -head to kind of drugs or others that have shown effect in that model? We haven't. We haven't done it. We have talked about it a, a hell of a lot, and we're still thinking about doing it, but um, not it, not in that particular one. We did head-to-head -head with other strain. It was actually uh, we we had other strains in the model to see what was performing better, but we haven't done that yet. Okay, Denise. Can I just ask you on the mode of action histamine? Did, you know, how did you how did you validate that? I'm, I'm curious. I mean, what was your validation that that was the mode of action that was relevant? Um, yeah, how do we how do we validate it in vivo? You mean? Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's diff it's a difficult. It's it's not something we can we can't isolate the, the histamine in the gut or anything. So so it's quite difficult, and it's a it's a very local. You know, this this effect is happening locally. So the only thing we can do is validate the effect on inflammation. Um, so that's really why we went into the DSS okay. model to show that. Michelle? Actually, I had a follow-up question on that as well, because I'm one of the people that uses almost half a year per year antihistamines. And will that affect? So basically, yeah. is it an exclusion criteria? Um, I don't think... Is antihistamines... Uh, I don't think we have that as an inclusion, exclusion criteria in the UC study, no. no. Again, it's a very... Did you want to say anything on that? We can talk about it after, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Again, it's a very local, localized effect with these bacteria, so, yeah. Just one question. I mean, I know BioGaia being a very research-driven company, so mm. uh, given the area that you're actually operating in, are you also looking into other aspects of your research, like 
just discovering new biomarkers for completely exploratory or are you very focused as a company we will get to the market by this date and you forget about the rest yeah we we um yeah and i think that that's something we talked about a lot when we set the company up and we we've really tried to um focus on the development side of it because i think we can get very quickly lost in the in the research side um i think there's a, there's interest in getting going back again uh, and doing that but um we yeah. still have the collaboration you know we ha we we network with Bioguy as well, so there's research going on there too. So mm. It's um, a bit yeah. of a coexistence. Yeah, the so reason why I'm asking is I know that you do. I mean, big guy as a company do a lot in metabolomics and so on. So that, uh, I think it's very interesting. So yeah, also very glad to see that uh, this angle coming through. Yeah. So any further question from you guys? So thank you, Nigel. Well done. Thanks. Thank you. gearing up and now is the time for the jury to deliver it on who the top two jury winners are going to be and Mikkel and Camilla will facilitate the conversation so I'll just ask the jury to stand up and make your way out of the room so you have time and privacy for some discussions and the jury will also be on a timer they have exactly 10 minutes to find the top two winners I know it's not going to be easy um, but while we have the jury on their way out of course the audience we would also like you to make your voice known. So the way that the audience choice is going to work is that you know, if you happen to choose the, the top company that is the same as the jury choice, we will take the next highest voted company. But what I wanted you to do is to go into the platform and one last minute to put your choices through, choose your top three companies. And if you choose the first that has a higher weighting, the third has a lower weighting. And one last minute. So. Let's do a countdown. Can I have some nice music, AV team, to help us get the blood flowing? Remember to click Submit once you've chosen your three options so we get it in. I see 43 votes have come in. Really good. Let's keep it going. Good. I see the votes coming in. Really good. Let's keep it up. We have 30 seconds more. The music has concluded before my countdown timer, which is absolutely fine. But we have about 20 seconds more. Remember to click Submit once you've chosen, including for you online. You want to get all of your votes in. 10 seconds left. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And there we go, 72 votes, excellent. I haven't looked at the results yet, that will come. Um, but of course our jury is going to be out there deliberating for another eight minutes. And someone was asking me, you know, Sarah, what are you going to do? Are you going to do a song and dance? And I'm going to spare you the song and dance. Um, but what we do have prepared for you is a little film about Medicon Valley. You know, just now Michael showed this microbiome man with the different areas that we are involved with. And one of the things that we are known in the region is our cohort studies and biobanks. So we have a little film that shows that, and I'll ask the uh, AV team to help me with that. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. And I'll see you in eight minutes. What I'm doing at the moment is working with a metabolite produced by a microorganism that shows a very nice potential in treating pancreatic cancer. It's only really been in the last 20 years that microbiome research has become a, a discipline in its own right. And it's really just in the last few years that medtech and biotech companies have been able to find practical applications for that research. Now, one of the interesting things about this microbiome explosion is that it's happened in a few geographical clusters. Medicon Valley is one of those, so we've came here to find out more. Medicon Valley is a life sciences cluster spanning eastern Denmark and southern Sweden. It's a fairly small area geographically, but it contains 1,150 companies, nine universities, and 65,000 people working in the life sciences sector. We're starting our journey by meeting Susanna briggs pedersen She's a professor of immunology at the Technical University of Denmark and her work involves researching interactions between the immune system 
and the human microbiome. Is there any particular area where you think that your microbiome research has made a, an especially large impact so far? Um, at the moment, I think we are just at the boundaries where we, we're starting to make impact. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, we, we have just identified specific bacteria in early life of children that when they, when they have them, then they have lower risk of development of, of food allergies. Where do you get the, the biological samples that you need to be able to do your research? Um, it's in collaboration with the hospital doctors, but also from the biobanks that we have here in the, yeah, next to Copenhagen. We have a national biobank, so you can track uh, diseases and all, or, all sorts of things uh, in, the, in a long-term perspective. Through someone's whole life cycle? Yeah. Uh, potentially. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, one of the illnesses where microbiome research could be crucial is asthma. So that's why we're on our way across the city to meet with Jakob Stockholm. He's a senior researcher at COPSAC. So, what exactly is COPSAC? Yeah, so COPSAC is the Copenhagen Prospective Studies of Asthma in Childhood. So that means that we have two different cohorts. Okay. And they have been followed from pregnancy and then throughout their lives very closely to monitor who will be healthy, who will be sick, and then collect a lot of material. Mm -hmm. We have gut samples, we have skin samples, we have airway samples, we have actually also dust samples. Um, and maternal vaginal samples from pregnancy. So quite many different microbiomes that you can actually study. All 700 of these, uh, of these participants, you're monitoring them regularly, they come here for exactly check-ins so. to, to find so out. We actually have a very, very high follow-up. Uh, at six years of age, we had a follow-up of 96% actually in the cohorts. And also here at the, the 18 years, which is the last visit so far in the, the old cohort, actually we have more than 90% coming into the clinics 18 years after they were born. Why do you think that is? I think actually it's a, they, they like to volunteer in, in the Scandinavian region. There are a willingness to participate from, uh, from parents. They want to actually help people, help research, um, which is very difficult in many other countries. So, cohort studies in Copenhagen, and there's a lot of cohort studies happening here in Sweden as well. We've come over to talk to Daniel Agart at Lund University's Clinical Research Centre. So within the Clinical Research Centre, there's more than one research group based here. Oh yes, the, the biggest core study is of course uh, the TEDDY study, right. which kind of is an international study involving six clinical sites to find uh, what causes type 1 diabetes. So mm -hmm. we are enrolling children that were HLA genotyped, which means that they, were, they had their genetic risk determined at birth. So we genotyped 425,000 between 2001 and 2004 to just get those with the high risk genes for type okay. 1 diabetes. Right. So eventually we ended up in with 21,000 children. 21,000, wow. Yeah, and 8,667 gave consent to a very ambitious protocol of a 15 year follow up. So as of we are now approaching the end, we have had on, overall in Teddy 200,000 clinical visits. From these 200,000 clinical visits, we have 200,000 stool samples. And we have 4 million blood samples. So it's a huge study. So as we have now collected all the samples, any researchers in, in the world can actually apply request to do an ancillary study. Of course, there's a lot more to Medicon Valley than research. It's also home to a thriving startup culture. So that's why I'm on my way now to meet someone who's doing something really interesting and building on that research and doing it in a way that lets consumers find out a lot more about their own microbiomes. We are a direct to consumer microbiome analysis company. So the user can get their microbiome mapped and then we give personalized diet feedback on how to improve their gut microbiome but we have a very strong uh, microbiome field in in the in the greater copenhagen area mm -hmm. there is a lot of science going on and uh, the entrepreneurship is is rising so we've spoken to researchers about asthma diabetes and other lifestyle related diseases and there's even more illnesses being targeted by scientific research here so has there been any particular breakthroughs that have emerged from the cohort studies here at uh, Skåne University Hospitals? 
There are, for instance, statins, which lower your blood cholesterol, mm-hmm. which have been found in studies to to have people treated a lower incidence of cancer. Mm-hmm. And that has been actually been confirmed for some cancers that if you're treated for that cancer, your relapse could be reduced by treating with these cholesterol lowering agents. There are will be many researchers who say that, oh, well, what about my study? Okay, but that, sure. that's just one example. Well, you know, the thing that really jumps out to me is the amount of resources that are here. That's true of the facilities and also the, the qualified people that are here. But most of all, I think that's true of data. And by that, I mean biobanks, repositories, biological samples, and other kind of materials. And all that is underpinned by the civil registration systems here, which makes that information all the more useful, all the more powerful. A lot of that has been made possible by the commitment of some of the people we've talked to. And I think they've really helped build a platform for a lot of the breakthroughs that have been made. And with that platform, I think that a lot of the breakthroughs are going to continue into the future. And it's quite a nice place to be as well. All right, I hope that you enjoyed a little film and our jury is just making their way back in and I see a lot of smiles, so I'm hoping it was a robust but fruitful debate. Um, And it's uh, gonna be really interesting to hear what they have chosen. And on that note, I would like to actually invite the chairman of the jury, Michelle, uh, if you could grab one of the handheld mics, um, to come on stage. And Michelle, if you could kind of give us a glimpse into some of the deliberations behind the scenes. Was it difficult finding our winners? Yes, um, thank you so much, at least for giving the opportunity as well here to speak on behalf of all my colleagues here in the jury, of course, not just on my behalf. Um, Yes, there were discussions, absolutely. And um, for those who had a chance to look on the the website to the short interview that was uh, written, on what are we looking for in a pitch deck. Um, Science, of course, is a very high uh, driving factor. Uh, But also we look at the team, and basically probably all my VC colleagues here will be uh, uh, championing that as well. Mm. Um, So yes, that were typically the type of uh, discussions we had. How is the product positioned? Do the the company understand the competitive landscape? How are they going to commercialize it, what is the business model? So those Mm. are typically the type of things that came up. Mm. And was it easy? No, it wasn't easy. I think all nine were brilliant speakers and we had a lot of debate and Mm. it was quite challenging. All right. Um, And is this something that makes the two winners stand out in this whole debate? There were some points that made the two winners stand out and I will uh, speak to that uh, when we get to there. All right, okay, great. Um, And the jury's choice, there will be a runner-up and then there'll be a first place. So maybe let's start with the runner-up. So Michelle, what is your thoughts about the runner-up that was chosen? Right, okay, the runner-up, let's let's start with that, is a company um, for which we thought the team was very good. We thought the science was very good, especially as well, because we thought this is thorough science, we, we understand it. They had IP, they had licensed IP. I'm giving away already here a couple of hints, perhaps. And what we thought was it was very novel as well. Mm. And the company name is Mycobiotics. Mike, welcome. You can come on stage. We have a little bouquet for you. Um, but of course, you will also stand to win a partnering ticket. So let's give him a round of applause. Please stay on stage, please stay on stage. Um, And Michelle, our top winner. Yes, and the top winner, of course, everybody will be uh, uh, very interested, I hope, at least. So, what did we see in the top winner? We saw a very solid scientific approach, which we really like. Um, The mechanism of action was explained, um, whether it's correct, we'll find out later. The team had experience, and that's an important part. Although we also give way, of course, to people that start their first companies. It's very important to generate new talent in the industry. Um, The company had manufacturing capabilities, which, of course, is a plus. 
and the approach was very novel. I think a lot of you will be able now to distill which company that was, and we'd like to congratulate BioGaia with the winning title. Nigel. Excellent. Um, thank you, Michelle. Um, may I, yeah, may I ask uh, for a last minute? Yes. Um, because I'm probably one of the last speakers here, not the final speakers. I would like to say a couple of words, hopefully on behalf of everybody here. Namely, the Microbiome Signature Project comes to an end, and I would like to thank the project partners for their enormous amount of energy, enormous amount of efforts they put in the project, making it such a success. We've seen in the, in the movie that started uh, this afternoon what the KPIs were that were accomplished, what enormous success it was. I'd like to thank you, I hopefully, on behalf of everybody, and maybe a warm round of applause for, for the organizers, please. Thank you so much, you Michelle, so much. for those kind words. Thank you. And of course, it's a joint effort, and later we'll give a proper thank you as well. Um, thank you so much. But I would like you both to say just a few words on some thoughts, and perhaps what can we expect from you in the coming two years before we have our next pick day, hopefully. Starting with you. Well, thank you, all of you. And uh, <clears throat> it, with, with nine nice pitches, they were all fantastic. It's really uh, an, an honor to be selected, so thank you. And, um, you know, it always comes down to money with these companies, so barring or assuming we can raise capital, uh, I hope we'll have a clinical readout, at least mm -hmm. in one program in the next two years. You know, maybe a partnering deal with somebody. Mm -hmm. Great. And Nigel. Thanks. Yeah. Um, as I said, I've been, I've been working with probiotics and microbiome for quite a long time, so it's fantastic to still see the, the level of innovation and see, and it's always good to come to these uh, meetings and see what's going on in the, in the industry. So, um, and then within two years, I mean, we, we have these, all our focus is just getting patients into a clinical study at the moment, to, two, to both of them. Uh, so hopefully we see some results at the end of next year and, mm. and we're in a, you know, we, we have some financing and we're looking ahead to the next phase. Excellent, thank you. Okay. All right, let's give them both another round of applause. Okay, go back first. All right, and of course we have the audience choice or the popular choice. Um, and I would say that this company really stood out in the kind of votes that it received. But before we disclose the winner, I know uh, Michael has a few words for all our pitching companies today. Yes, of course. I mean, I told you, have fun, learn, share your experience, show your passion, and I think you've all done that. So I think we should all give you a, a warm applause. <laughs> well done, and next time it will be even easier, and uh, keep on fighting for it. Huh? So, but now... The it, winner. The winner of the audience. Is... Gadia Biotech. Oh. Welcome on stage. Sorry, I only have one bouquet, but uh, I can split it for you both, but... Uh, we used yeah, congrats. We yeah, co yeah, congrats. <laughs> Congratulations. Could you just share a few words about, similar question, what are your reflections and what can we expect from Gear Biotech in the next two years? Say thank you all. We are very proud and honoured, and uh, we definitely uh, think we have a good uh, company and a good product to work forward on, and an unmet need to be covered with the product. Uh, and we look very much forward to uh, pre presenting the results from our clinical trial uh, in full, and also for the upcoming collaborations for uh, interesting mm -hmm. upcoming, so the vaginal candidiasis, for example preterm birth, the vaginal microbiome analysis from the large phase 2B trial in collaboration with our new bioinformatics PhD student. So we have a lot of things. Exciting. Lots of exciting things. A lot of exciting things <laughs> that we're looking forward to. Excellent. On that note, can I invite all pitching companies to come and stage for a photo op? It'd be great to see the breadth of potential we have. So just all night come on stage. Um, the winners, please bring your bouquets and uh, come to the center. It's a bit of a pop of color. So can I invite Gidea Biotech? Could you come and stand in the center? And I'll have Microbiotics, as well as Biogea Pharma to come in the center. N Nigel, with your flowers, if you have it. Exactly. <laughs> so I'll have my photographer take a nice photo. He's making his way.
Can you move closer to me? Excellent. Thank you. All right, everyone. On that wonderful note, uh, I think Michelle said it so nicely, and it's been such a privilege um, for us to work together. Uh, come, you know, three organizations that span Copenhagen and Skorna with Medicon Valley in the middle kind of straddling both. Um, yes. And it has been, it's been wonderful <laughs> and it's been amazing to do this together in the midst of a pandemic that we didn't realize we'd get into. Um, but as Michelle said, we're really proud of the results that we accomplished and we couldn't have done it without working together. A yeah. um, couple of words, Mikkel? Yeah, now there's some champagne and other stuff, good stuff out there. Uh, if you stay on for the Nordic Life Science Days, you can go down and pick up your badge. We have a fantastic booth with the barista coffees in the morning, so you should really come and see us tomorrow morning. Uh, and there is also some welcome drinks there tonight. So, hope you enjoy the day and hope you stay on for some time more. And Camilla. You. Before we go out to the champagne, just a big thank you to all of you who have come here. A special thank you for the jury. Yes. It's been fantastic having you uh, really representing all over. Europe, <laughs> and also the people online. So thank you. We hope you've enjoyed this micro round pitch day just as much as we have. And on that note, it does not end here. Um, the project might have finished, but we have a live and kicking microbiome network that will continue. We meet two times a year, either in Skåne or in Copenhagen. So make sure you find out more. Go to this link, check out the MVA's website, and you'll stay in touch with what's happening. But I won't keep you from the champagne and all the good stuff out there, so thank you very much once again for your time, and I wish you a pleasant evening. Thank you. Thank you.